no problem. Okay, I got thank, you now, though. Thank you. Uh huh. Let's move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statement. Uh, again, I, I believe we just have the minutes from our May 28th meeting in this packet. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, before we move approval, there may be other comments as well. I did notice that the very first motion on the adjustments to the agenda, there were no actual names listed for who made the motion and who made the second. Right. Um, we'll have to check on that. I'm, I'm not sure. We're going to have to go back and look at the tape. We're not sure that someone made a motion. So we'll, we'll double check that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That was one of the things that the clerk, uh, the, the, ba the backup clerk, Ms. Elliott, asked me to look into. So we'll check that and correct it if we need to. Okay. Thank you. Any other, any other comments? Or if not, I'll take a motion to approve. Make such a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Okay, uh, moved by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Commissioner Lowe, and we'll have a roll call vote for approval. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Williams? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Landfried? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Chair Busby? Um, Commissioner Amendola? Yes. Commissioner Miller is absent. Commissioner Keenchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago is absent. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Yes. Okay. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Um, and just, uh, Chair Busby, for the record, we wanted to um, remind the commissioners that there is, um, because this is virtual, if someone drops from the meeting, your vote is not counted as a yes. You are, you're counted as out of the meeting and not voting. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, we've approved the, the uh, minutes. Uh, we'll go to adjustments to the agenda, Ms. Smith. So um, staff would like to offer one adjustment to the agenda and add one item under new business, uh, an additional item under new business after the uh, work program. We need to um, take care of the vacancy of the vice chair. Our rules of procedure state that in the vacancy of the chair before the um, chair's term is has expired, the vice chair will step up and serve as chair automatically. So we need to elect a vice chair this evening. Great, thank you. And uh, that's it for adjustments? And that's it for the adjustments. I do want to state for the record that all advertisements and uh, legal requirements have been carried out in accordance with state and local law, and all of those affidavits are on file in the planning department. Great, thank you. Uh, could I get a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call just has to be updated. I'm sorry? The roll call is incorrect as listed on the agenda. Um, I think we correct, we may have posted it online correct. It may have been incorrect at one point, but we fixed it online. Okay. Yeah, so you, mm -hmm. you may have one that was sent out prior to it being updated. Okay, so, <laughs> so, um, so we just need to make, thank you, uh, Commissioner Durkin. So we, we, we have a motion and a second to approve the amended agenda, and we'll have a roll call vote. Was the first Al Turk and second Commissioner Morgan? I believe so. Okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Landfried? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. And Chair Busby? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Amendola? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Is absent. Oops. Commissioner Keenchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago is absent. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner McIver? Okay, thank you. Passes unanimous.
Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to our first case item on tonight's agenda. This is Fox Place. It's case A19 quadruple zero four and concurrent zoning case Z19 quadruple zero five. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening. Jamie Cognac with the planning department. I will be presenting Fox Place. It's a consolidated land use item. Next slide, please. The applicant is uh, Cliff Cradle from Cradle Engineering. The property is located at 8705 NC Highway 751. The property is currently located uh, within the county, but there's a pending annexation application. The property is about um, just under three acres in size. It's located within the suburban tier. There is a request to change the zoning to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan um, with uh, up to 11 single family detached homes. The, um, in addition to the zoning map change, there's also a, a proposed change for the um, future land use map designation from recreation open space to low um, to low residential, low density residential. There's a typo on that slide. Next slide, please. The aerial map shows the property highlighted in red. It's located on the east side of NC Highway 751. The property is undeveloped. Uh, it contains a stream and a pond feature. Next slide, please. The staff report has several um, area photos. Some of them are depicted here. Uh, the property is bordered by the Panthers Ridge development just east, east of the site. Um, other residential developments nearby include Hens Huntington Ridge, Eagles Point, and Kensington residential development to the north. Um, it is also abutted by state-owned lands to the north, west, and south. Uh, which are within the recreation open space future land use designation. Next slide, please. The site, the site is located within the suburban development tier and falls within the Falls Jordan District B watershed protection overlay. This slide shows the existing zoning on the left with the property in rural residential and then the proposed residential suburban multifamily on the right in orange. Next slide. Uh, this shows the future land use map designation. Again, the property is currently within recreation and open space, and the applicant is seeking a change to low density residential. Next slide. Um, here is the development plan that has been included in the staff report, which highlights the access points, the building and parking envelopes, riparian buffer, and 10 foot no build, the two coverage areas, and the project boundary buffers. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of a summary of, of text commitments, which have been included on the cover sheet of the development plan, there is a restriction in terms of single family residential units as being the permitted building type with a maximum number of 11 units. There's a restriction of a right in right out at the site entrance on NC Highway 751, as well as other graphic commitments included on the plan. Next slide, please. Uh, as noted, the proposed zoning is not consistent with the existing future land use designation of the site. And as a result, the applicant is seeking a future land use map amendment, which would then be consistent with the rezoning request. The proposal is consistent with the other comprehensive plan policies included in this list on the screen and further detailed in the staff report. Next slide. Staff determined that uh, these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to an answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Soniak, appreciate it. Uh, we will move to open the public hearing. And just so fellow commissioners know, the advanced number of folks who signed up to speak on this item at the moment is 19. And so there are two signed up in support. Um, the rest are signed up in opposition. There are a couple who have not 
who didn't uh, didn't tell us which way they were speaking on the issue, but there, there's a fair amount of people who have signed up to speak this evening. Uh, normally what we, we do, and we, we allow each side 10 minutes under our normal rules of procedure, I would recommend, as we often do, to extend that to make sure that we give everyone time to share their thoughts. Uh, I might recommend two minutes per person. Uh, that's often what we do, but I'm open to thoughts from other commissioners and would entertain a motion for how we would go about the public hearing process tonight on this item. Commissioner Arthur? Yeah. Thanks, Chair Busby. Um, I'll, uh, I'll remember to use the uh, raise hand uh, function in the chat or the, um, but I was thinking that I, I think it makes sense to do, to give folks more than just 10 minutes on each side. So I like two minutes each. Um, I wonder though, for the applicant, if we can give them a little bit more time, maybe because uh, it's just two people in favor. So maybe a few more minutes to either respond to some of the feedback. I think we've done, we do that often. Uh, give the those in favor some more time to respond. So um, I don't know if we need a motion for that, but I, I think maybe 10 minutes for the for those in favor and then two minutes each for the others. Can we do that? Have we done that before? I, I believe we have. We can check with, with Ms. Smith on staff, but I, I would agree that the proponents may have put together 10 minutes worth of time and um, we, we will certainly then allow everyone then to, to share their thoughts. Uh, Ms. Smith, is that appropriate? Um, yes, we can do 10 minutes, allow the applicant 10 minutes to make their presentation and two minutes per speaker on the other side, considering how many are signed up. I mean, we've done that in the past. So uh, Commissioner Alturk, if you want to put that in the motion, we can, we can vote for approval. Sure, um, I move that we give the applicants a total of 10 minutes and uh, those, or, or and opponents two minutes each in the public hearing. We have a second. second. Thank you, Commissioner Lowe. Uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Second. Did Commissioner Lowe second? Yes. Yes, All right. yes. okay. All right, so uh, Commissioner McIver? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Santiago is absent. Commissioner Tension? Yes. Commissioner Miller is absent. Commissioner Lanfried? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Amendolia? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, passes unanimous. Two minutes for each um, speaker uh, proponent and 10 minutes, I mean, uh, opponent and 10 minutes for the proponent. Great, thank you. So we'll start with the two proponents. We have Mavis James and Trans Perry have signed up to speak in support of the proposal. Yes, uh, this is Trans Perry. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm the um, I'm I'm the property owner of 8705 NC Highway 51. Uh, my name is Trans Perry, spelled T-R-A-N-S, last name Perry, P as in Paul, E-R-R-Y. Uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in Durham. Just to give a little background about myself, I'm born and raised in Durham. Uh, lived here pretty much my whole life except when I went to college in New Orleans. Um, uh, uh, I went to Hillside, local product of Hillside, played sports there. Uh, and after college, I worked for Walgreens, and I came back home around 08 and started renovating and building houses. I uh, started primarily in the uh, downtown district uh, around Cleveland Holloway, Moorhead Hills. Um, and I've renovated and built over 30 houses, probably close to about 35 houses um, here in the Durham area since uh, 2000, started since 2009. 
Um, I'm very excited about this project. Uh, I think it's very uh, consistent with the neighbor, I mean, with the area as far as like uh, what's proposed as far as like single family residential. Um, I've had, I remember I had the neighborhood meeting a few months back and uh, seems like, seems like it wasn't, you know, seems like, you know, some people were excited, you know, some people had questions, but uh, like, like I expressed at the neighborhood meeting, the, the, um, the proposed project, like I said, pretty consistent with Chancellor's Ridge, you know, uh, and uh, that's pretty much, and, well, I guess, I guess to say about the homes, the homes that, the homes that I will build, I build custom homes. Uh, you know, I, I build houses built from, I guess you can say from, like, like they were built in 1900s, you know, hardwood floors, custom casings, uh, mason fireplaces, very custom homes, high quality. Um, I, you go around downtown Durham, I have my sign up at my houses. I'm, you know, I try to try to build them quality, like I would have, like, like if I built, like if I would move in them. So, uh, I'm very excited about this project. Um, and I'm, um, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank and, you, thank you. And Mavis James? Chair, I do not see Mavis James. This is Chris Peterson from Planning Department. I do not see Mavis James on our list of attendees. If Mavis is joining, please use the raise hand function so we can properly identify. And again, that's star nine on the phone. Okay. Well, I'll propose that we move forward hearing from other folks who have signed up to speak. And if, if Mavis James joins us, we can hear, we can hear that later. Uh, so we're gonna move to folks who signed up in advance as opponents of the project. We're just gonna read, you're listed in the order that you signed up. So we're just gonna run down this list. Uh, again, two minutes per speaker and the staff will help uh, let you know when you are near the, your, your time. Uh, what I would say is that two minutes goes really quickly. And so if, it, if it's time to wrap up your comments, I, we generally just have a, a rule that says you can finish your thought. So you don't have to stop in the middle of the sentence, but please complete your thought. And, and we'll move on from there. Uh, Michelle Alexander, Xander Dumain, and Dan Gindes are our first three folks who have signed up to speak. Uh, so Ms. Alexander. You might be on mute. Yeah, I see, I see Michelle Alexander is on here, but is on mute. So if there's a way to come off of mute. Uh, Hi, this is Xander Dumain. Am I okay to go? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, please go ahead and we'll, we'll work on getting Michelle Alexander off of mute. Thank you. Okay, great. My name is Xander Dumain. I live at 312 Marist Court. Uh, in the Chancellor's Ridge neighborhood. Um, my primary concern with this project is twofold um, with a, another small note. Uh, I'll say initially, um, my understanding is that this is a multi-home dwelling. So the, the proponent's claim about it being very consistent with Chancellor's Ridge is a little confusing to me because the Chancellor's Ridge neighborhood that the property is immediately adjacent to is primarily um, single family dwellings, and my understanding is that the proposal is for multifamily dwellings, so it does not seem like it would be consistent with the neighborhood. Um, but my primary concern that I signed up to talk about is for, uh, is kind of twofold related to two of the features on the property, one being the stream and pond, so the, the stream and pond that are features of that property. Um, I know that every year that I've lived in Chancellor's Ridge, uh, al at least almost every year for the past uh, four or five years, um, Stagecoach Road, which is across 751 from the property, has flooded. Um, my concern is whether the development would contribute to the flooding of Stagecoach Road, which causes closings of that road. Um, the second issue, second concern that I have is due to traffic. That intersection is, is notoriously bad for traffic. 
even though there's a restriction for right in right out and concern that the additional traffic for 11 multifamily uh, units would be almost prohibitive to people going in and out of that uh, inter going through that intersection um, it, especially if they're the stream and pond contribute to the flooding on stagecoach road um, and then the second is purely environmental that is recreational use area that stream and pond are homes to um, lots of wildlife that contribute that help maintain a, a low population of rodents. Things like snakes and turtles contribute to reduce rodents and bugs in the area. So my concern primarily around the, the actual features of that land and how they would contribute to traffic and the environment of that area. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Alexander, are you able to come off of mute and speak? We'll, uh, we'll move to Dan Gindes. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. How are you? My name is Dan Gindes. Um, I live at 142 College Avenue in the Chancellor's Ridge Development. Um, my house uh, backs up to the Civil Corps of Engineering land that uh, is adjacent to this proposed uh, uh, property. Um, so a, a few things really quickly. I'm going to focus on, ironically, I don't know Xander. It was nice to hear from him, but I, I've, I don't know him, but I have the same exact concerns primarily. But first off, uh, I want to point out that slideshow that we saw. Uh, quite interestingly, there was a GIS pick in the beginning. Um, that was pretty old. So this area does not look like that anymore. Uh, if you look at that GIS, there have been developments dropped left and right. Uh, I bought this house in August of 14. Um, I moved here from Indianapolis. I, I can't believe the development that occurs. It's a wonderful thing, but every wonderful thing has some setbacks. And uh, in this case, with the, in my opinion, overdevelopment of this area, the setbacks are primarily traffic and the effect on wildlife slash environment. So um, my, my biggest concerns are um, the traffic pattern. This, somebody spent a lot of money and a lot of time and just rebuilt the intersection at 751 and Stagecoach. They certainly didn't ask my opinion, but whatever they did was not a fix of the traffic problem. Um, so a proposed project like this is only going to further worsen the traffic. If people are making a left out of that development, or more importantly, if someone coming south on 751 to turn left into that development, they're going to back that traffic, which I've seen backed up to the Bonefish Grill by Route 40 a mile away, it's going to be just a horrendous scene. And at the end of the day, when you're trying to get home from work, it's not what you want to deal with. Um, the stagecoach flooding is something that I also started to notice in the last five years. I worked at UNC Hospital and would drive that route all the time. Um, it's almost a delayed flooding, but it occurred frequently. And now it seems to be happening a couple times a year. Um, we're getting wildlife in our front yard, foxes, things getting driven out from all this other development and i was under the impression i've talked to people who weren't here who lived here 10 years ago stagecoach never flooded and then they built the development just north of it and then they they built 751 south just south of it and then all of a sudden there's a water problem um, it seems that these things were overlooked i don't want to overlook these things again when it's in my backyard this time um again um. yes Thank you guys for your time and and uh, and for considering. Uh, I, I think that this gentleman who owns the property should have every right to build what the Thank property you, was designated for. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we then have Jason Gonzalez followed by Blake Hassebrock and Richard Smith. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. So my name is Jason Gonzalez. I, I also am coming from Chancellor's Ridge at uh, 1134 Scholastic Circle. Uh, I'd first like to second and third the points already made by Xander and Dan in um, regards to traffic and, and, and certainly the environment. Um, the, the, these were points that I, I had already hoped to make, but uh, I, I won't hammer those in a, a, again to, to use up that time. Um, but in regards to the traffic challenges, I, I've already been in a pretty horrendous car accident just trying to drive back into Chancellor's Bridge. So I, I just want to echo and, and really uh, push that one, uh, the importance of, of that and our already congested roads. Um, but even more so, it, it pains me here to even consider the possibility that more of the greenery with the, the massive developments that have been going on around here are now going to be cleared away 
further congesting the area, especially at the time now with even our school districts are already congested. Um, there are talks of, of requiring additional schools, um, no longer accepting some students at, at the ones that are existing that we, we, we moved here with the intention of being a part of. Um, roads bogged down, as we've already said. I mean, I recognize our population here in the South Durham area is growing as it is throughout the triangle. Um, but there's got to be a more sensible way to address this growth and, and this land without stacking houses on top of one another. Um, up to 11 houses and less than three acres is hardly what I'd call value, a high quality value for that area. Um, while I have no doubt that Mr. Perry intends to, to build high quality houses, and it certainly sounds like uh, he, he tries to stay true to that, um, I, I have to believe the value of the, those homes as well as the, the homes in the areas uh, around this, this proposed development will significantly be diminished without this greenery for not only aesthetic reasons, but also as, as Xander and Dan have pointed out for environmental and safety reasons as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Blake Hassebrock. It looks like you're on mute. You can, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Looks like you're good. There we go. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, my name is Blake Hassebrock. I live at 212 Graduate Court um, and our homes along the northern border of this parcel in question. Uh, just a little background, I'm a 31-year-old father of two, um, born and raised in the Carolinas. My wife and I have invested in this community. Um, we purchased and fully renovated our home about two years ago, and uh, we do aspire to spend the next 20 years here in Chancellor's Ridge. So when we purchased our home, we did rely on the future land use map designation, um, as many other of the neighbors have, to decide what the future looked like uh, for our family. And so... The first point is that I would like to trust that that future land use map is reliable on one hand, um, but then on the other, I feel we all need to consider how this affects not only us, but the generations to come. So the parcel in question is very low and slopes into a gully um, or a stream that flows beneath that 751 into the Army Corps land on the opposite side. Uh, so because of this, I, I oppose the proposal to change the future land use map from open space to low density residential. Uh, the staff says it's in the report that the open space designation for the property must have been a mistake, but they don't explain why they say that. Uh, so I don't think it was a mistake at all. And if you drive along the 751, you'll instantly see that the land contains a drainage feature directly reaching into the Jordan Lake watershed. Um, so to me, this is an unusual request to take land out of the open space recreation designation um, to accommodate the development. I've noticed in being here a long time, the city's made minor boundary adjustments here and there. Um, but never anything this vast in my, in my experience. So Jordan Lake is currently a drinking water source uh, for several cities, including Durham. And today we get our water from, from uh, other cities that use Jordan water. So we do plan the future to put our own straw in there. Um, and then you may argue that 2.8 acres might not matter much, but I argue that 11 single family residences can't be so important that we should strip another parcel from the highest protections we can give a drinking water source. So once the parcel's gone, it's gone. And then the decision's made and we can't correct that in the future. Um, and so, you know, to look out for the environment and generations to come, that's, that's my stance. Um, then on the other hand, if we even Thank are you. to, is that time? It is, yeah. Okay, okay. The other, the other argument I would make would just be that the development plan wasn't uh, thorough enough, so. That's all I've got. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Richard Smith. And Richard, while you come off of mute, we'll have Joy Sweeting, Caleb White, James, um, P-S-I-C-H-O-S. -S. I'm just gonna spell it because I'm gonna do a terrible job with it. Those are the next few folks to speak. Uh, but Richard Smith, if you can come off of mute, and love to hear your public comment. And again, star nine if you're on the phone to unmute yourself. While he's unmuting, I'm Joy Sweeting and I did not sign up to speak. I'm sorry, I'm just listening. Oh, okay, so you do, you do not look to speak this evening? 
No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't we move to Caleb White? All right, Caleb, I see your hand up. You are free to speak. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody here. Um, so first off, I uh, would like to give a lot of respect to everybody here. I appreciate that we're all here and talking about this issue. Um, but I do have a lot of concerns about this. I am a member, um, I live in um, Chancellor's Ridge, I'm, and I'm really concerned about this development coming out because I just feel like it really is not in, in line with what we have designated for the residential density. And um, just generally speaking, I also, I, I was looking for a little bit more information on what was going to be happening with the water feature. Because by the looks of the plans, it looks like they're going to just to somehow develop over like a giant water hole in the ground. So I just think that that there maybe should be some more discussion about how that even is going to happen. Um, but generally speaking, I'm just I'm really concerned with the traffic that's going to be coming into the community based on this development. Again, I don't think it's in, in line with the actual um, the density of housing that's in this community. And I really am worried about that environmental in, impact based on that pond, based on the watershed, and also the flooding aspect actually was very interesting that people were bringing that one up because I think that's also a very interesting point. And it does seem like the flooding has gotten a little bit more poignant in the, the later years, but anyways, I will, I will cut myself off there and thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you. Uh, Richard Smith, are you able to speak at this point? If not, James P, I see your muted as well, but if you're available to speak, you can star nine and offer your testimony. So I just unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I can echo. And can you, do you mind stating things. your name and address and then you Sorry, can- yeah. Sure, yeah, I apologize. My name is James Sikos. I live at uh, 108 College Ave, uh, which is in Chantos Ridge, sort of directly off from where, behind the area where this is gonna be developed. A um, Couple points, I pretty much, Agree with all the people that are opposed to this, the things they've said. I was at the at the neighborhood meeting that uh, Trans Perry held, and I would say that the majority of the participants were against his proposal, and it was not a very positive atmosphere. Actually, um, I will echo that the aerial maps are way outdated, and the pictures in his proposal do not include any from the actual entrance, which is walled off by steel barriers, which he had to have uh, removed and you know make a very narrow right turn only access on 751. That whole area has been redone. There's no aerial photos in his proposal that show that. Um, it's not a similar development to Chancellor's Ridge. Our lots average about a quarter acre in size. And if you take away the area that he can't develop on that property, he's looking at probably between 0.13 and 1.4 of an acre for each unit. And that doesn't even include the road and cul-de-sac that you have to put in to turn around. Um, the access is gonna be horrible. The traffic is already horrible. It hasn't gotten any better. 751 South is gonna make that even worse. Um, and the Jordan Lake runoff is, is, is gonna contribute to that as well. Happy to let them develop it as it is right now with the three or four homes that he put there. That's probably a nice valid use for that piece of property. But I will say that, uh, you know, all the points that have been addressed are valid points. And I'm kind of disappointed that really none of that was brought up in the staff's uh, you know, rebuttal of his proposal. It almost kind of looks like it's rubber stamp, which kind of bothers me because I feel like that's what happened with 751 South. Um, I think I have a list of everyone that attended that first meeting as well, which included two attorneys and a commercial appraiser, and none of them were happy with that. So, and they do live in the neighborhood. Um, Thank you, Mr. Seacoast. Yeah, sure, yep, thanks. 
Uh, Richard Smith, I'm going to circle back. It looks like you might be available to speak. My apologies. There's no comments, just supporting as a resident to the opposers. Okay, thank you. Ben Kunkel, followed by Elizabeth Scalco and Jackie Baby Smith. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Ben Kunkel. I'm at a 206 Graduate Court. Grew up in uh, Durham, North Carolina. I've been here for over 40 years. Um, I've had this property for the past 11 years. Um, things are getting real crowded down here in this area. Um, I agree with everything, everything everybody has said thus far. The traffic has been an ongoing issue. The expansion and addition of turning lane at a 751 South and Stagecoach has not really alleviated any of the traffic issues. Having 11 more homes in this property with the right in and right out, there's no way that's going to be helpful for anyone, I would say. Um, the stagecoach flooding has definitely gotten worse in the past several years. Um, the flooding, I mean, it shuts things down for weeks at a time at various points in the past few years. The 751 development, um, 751 South has definitely made that worse. I can't imagine adding 11 homes here in the sort of drainage area is going to help that at all. Um, the wildlife impact, I mean, you're talking about directly paving over what is a very large pond right there, and that's going to cause a lot of wildlife to have to flee the area or turn up in other people's yards. It's not going to help with rodent control or the bugs and pests in the area. Um, yeah, I don't have anything significant to contribute other than agreeing with all the points that have come before me, but I don't understand how this would necessarily help. The maps seem wildly out of date. And I mean, 11 homes on that small parcel of land is not going to be a particularly, regardless of the quality of the homes, like it's just not gonna be a lot of very effective use of the land. It's gonna be very small areas for the development for the actual houses. Yeah, I have pretty much nothing else to contribute other than I would strongly oppose this measure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Scalco. Hi, hello, my name is Betsy Scalco, and I've lived in the Chancellor's Ridge neighborhood since the first year was built in 1999, before South Point Mall and much of the development on Highway 751 and Fayetteville Road. Over the past 21 years, I have watched as lots of retail development, two apartment complexes, three hotels, three big churches, an auto park, and five large neighborhoods, including the 751 assemblage monstrosity have been built on 751 in Fayetteville. In 1999, Highway 751 had no streetlights between Chancellor's Ridge and Highway 54. Now it is five. Stagecoach Road had a one lane bridge where you had to wait and take turns crossing. Now it's been raised and widened with streetlights at both ends and it was still closed multiple times last year for flooding. I've never spoken out, I'm not against development, I live in a neighborhood built just two decades ago, but all of this growth has affected the traffic on Highway 751 with no widening or significant improvements and the Jordan Lake watershed and flooding along Stagecoach Road. The land in question for rezoning has an existing pond that is often full. Where will that water go once you have all that impervious surface? Chancellor's Ridge had to build three water retainment ponds when it was built and they have never been full of water. Actually, they rarely have much water in them at all, but this pond does. The land in question has a difficult access off Highway 751, where it would currently be illegal, not to mention very unsafe, to turn if headed south or to turn north, to turn south if headed out of it. Allowing a right out and right in only addresses the turning traffic, but instead they will turn around in the Chancellor's Ridge neighborhood to go back north. Now, maybe you say it's a small piece of land, less than three acres, what does it matter? And I would say that's exactly why it matters. It's a small piece of land. Let's leave it alone and not shoehorn so many homes onto this property. Thank you. Thank you. 
Jackie Beatty Smith, and then we'll be followed by Nicole Cruz and Donna Kay. So Jackie Beatty Smith, are you with us and able to speak? I'm sorry, this is Mavis James. I'm late for joining the meeting, but I can speak after everyone has um, stated their concern. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great plan. I appreciate you letting us know you're here. Uh, if Jackie Beatty Smith is not with us, we'll go to Nicole Cruz. I don't see anyone raising their hand. We'll go to Donna Kay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm Donna Kay. I live at 202 Alumni Avenue. And again, I'm not anti-development. I live in Transfers Ridge. I'm glad to. Uh, like many people, mainly concerned about the flooding and the watershed. And I guess my question, because I did not come out as a Opposed or, or uh, for is I, I do think that there needs to be a study. I understand that the actual uh, site plan review or to do the calculation to see if flooding would occur is, is kind of a big deal. I know it's expensive, but I think that if this project needs to be considered, that has to happen. It's just not fair to anyone, including those future homeowners in that community to go forward without that kind of plan. And I guess I want to know, is the city um, prepared to, if, if you do go through with this, or you, are you prepared to request that kind of study to know what we're dealing with? But I think that's my main concern is moving forward without all the information. Great, thank you. And is, and is the developer willing to invest the money for that? Uh, uh, last question. May, also, I'm confused about, it says it's multifamily homes, but then I heard it's 11 individual homes. So are these, are these individual townhomes? Are they single family homes? I wasn't sure about that either. Great, thank you very much. And just so you know, during the public comment period, this is your opportunity to, to make your statement and raise questions. When we close the public comment period, the commissioners have time to ask the of the staff or the proponent or, or anyone else any questions and make comments. So it's helpful to hear your questions and, and commissioners may raise those on your behalf during the discussion phase of the hearing. Hey, because I, I want to be open-minded and hear what the data has to say. And I'm just not clear what what is there. And I understand that it really, that work has not been done yet. It's not appropriate time to do it, but that I think it really needs to be done. So thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Sherman Servati. I see your hand raised. Uh, you can speak if you're unmuted. I can't hear you. I don't know if others can hear you or not. We will circle back to you. There seems to be a, an audio issue on your side. Uh, we've got two more folks who are signed up to speak. We have Betsy Weatherhead and Ashley Gonzalez. So Betsy Weatherhead, if you want to speak. Or Ashley Gonzalez, are you with us? Okay, I don't see any of those folks. I do see a few hands raised. Uh, Kristen Sherman Servati, do you want to try again and speak? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Can you hear me? Speak up. It's still quiet. And I see the pond um, that, that we've talked about that floods very frequently. I have been here for 16 years. Um, and well before all the development that has happened, 
um, that, that I know Betsy talked about. Um, I don't know all my neighbors, uh, I, but I do uh, echo um, most of the concerns here. My major concern is that this land is designated for recreation and open space on the future land use map. I remember when there was an actual resident in that very small house on that uh, 2.5 acre uh, parcel. And um, one of the reasons I moved here was because Army Corps of Engineer land backed up to, the, to my property. Um, and uh, I, I know that we all, um, at least Chancellor's Ridge has, has had um, you know, considerations for the way that it was developed in light of and in compliance with um, the, the storm uh, water uh, 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 planning for Jordan Lake. Um, the, the flooding is a major issue. Flooding happens down behind my property just in the Army Corps of Engineer land as, as it is. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really concerned about utilizing that small space um, and having a lot of uh, impervious um, land or impervious space uh, taken over um, on what is pervious. Great, thank you. Thank you for your comments and your persistence getting through to us. So we have finished, I'm just gonna read the names of names who are on here who didn't reply just to give you one more chance and then we'll go to Mavis James and any additional folks. But Michelle Alexander, uh, Jackie Baby Smith, Nicole Cruz, Betsy Weatherhead or Ashley Gonzalez or any of you with us this evening and wish to speak. Okay, I don't think you're here. Uh, we will go to Mavis James, and then I see a few other hands raised who I assume are individuals who would like to speak. If you've spoken already, you, you have one opportunity to speak during the public comment period, but we will call on you if you have not spoken. Uh, Mavis James? Yes, hi. So um, in regards, I am for um, the development of the property. Myself being someone who has been around Durham for a long time, also knew the original owner of the property, the Carltons who lived on that property. Um, the property was in their family for a number of years um, prior to um, it being taken over by the Army Corps engineers as well as um, Mr. Carlton allowing for when they developed Chancellor's Ridge to um, use some of his property for the development of Chancellor's Ridge itself. Um, I'm also um, very familiar with Trans Perry, the person who is looking to develop the land and is also the owner of the land at this time, um, and has spoken to him because I was actually the one who introduced him to the Carlton, and has spoken to him about his plans for the development um, they are single family homes and not necessarily saying it'll be 11 homes, but it's up to 11 single family homes, um, which myself uh, being interested in one of the homes itself, as far as um, the pond and flooding, um, Mr. Perry um, has looked into flooding of the pond and um, will continue working to make sure that the pond is not, is one, um, he wants to preserve it for the property itself, but two, for to make sure that it's not something that's gonna flood the community. I don't believe that um, anyone would build a home um, and put it at risk for flooding or having the pond flooded. And um, just thinking about my current, um, neighborhood now there's always a reservoir for the water to go into so no one who's going to develop a plan is going to go in knowing that these homes may potentially flood so i think that's something that realistically we need to go ahead and look 
um, at the bigger picture. No one's going to build a home that's going to flood. Mr. Perry actually has um, a very good reputation with the homes he's built around Durham. Um, and I actually don't think that um, the homes would, or the residents of the homes would actually cause any issues with traffic. You have 11 single family homes. Um, as far as adding adding to the traffic, I don't see how that would change that would change the actual traffic pattern that we have right now on uh, 751. I don't feel that those cars would act those people who live in that neighborhood would cause more traffic than what it is already on that road. Great, thank you for your comments. Thank we you. We are going to move to the individuals who have raised their hands who have not spoken this evening, and I'm just going to call you in order. If you would like to speak, this will be your, your two minute public comment opportunity. Audra Slavin. Hey, my name is Audra Slavin. I'm at 126 College Avenue, and I'm an original owner here as well. Um, most of the comments have been said, but when I did buy here with the future land use, the Corps of Engineer um, property and no building behind it, I actually paid a premium for this lot. So it, they, you know, I paid more to live here with the understanding that we would not be developing behind there. And so now what we're saying is we're going to develop behind there. You're going to fill in that creek. It's not that long a walk down into Corps of Engineer to where you hit that creek and it does flood. I've been in it, my dog has gotten down in there before, I've had to get her out. Um, so everything else everybody's saying is very true about the flooding. Um, when we developed the farmland off of 751 onto Stagecoach, it never flooded before then. As soon as you did that, that's what created the flooding five years ago that we continually um, experience. So everything that Dan and Betsy and everyone has said is absolutely what we experience. And then the traffic has really grown. It's difficult to get in and out of the development. So I hope the commissioners will take all of the comments seriously and why the reasons of being opposed. And I appreciate your time. And I also want to thank Jamie for providing answers in advance to some of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Cliff Cradle. Hey, this is uh, Cliff with Cradle Engineering. I am in Durham, 204 East Markham Avenue. How are y'all doing this evening? Doing well. Please uh, make your comments. All right. So I actually worked on this as a surveyor and engineer and understand what these concerns are. Um, in, in looking at this parcel, we did look at the flooding that is adjacent to us. Actually, the parcel was much larger originally and was acquired by the Army Corps of Engineers from the original owner. And that was in development of the uh, Jordan Lake. And the Army Corps knew that this was going to flood, and that's why they purchased this land. And there's land to the northwest of us and to the south of us that is owned and still owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. So flooding is, was anticipated. It is in a floodplain. Does it, does it flood? Yes. Um, is that going to stop? I don't see that stopping. Are we contributing to that uh, with this amount of homes? No. Um, matter of fact, we're not allowed to by the city ordinance in, in moving forward on this site. And all of those have to go in before the first building permit is, um, is approved. Um, so the little pond on the site, which um, which was obviously man-made, does it flood? It might get full, but the only con contributing water to that is coming from Chancellor's Ridge. Um, and then it goes into a small creek that is right off the property that goes back into the Corps of Engineers property. So that was anticipated also. Um, it is a nice little feature. We hope to save it, um, not make any commitments on it at this point since I'm not the owner, but hope to save that. But that was a man-made feature. 
um, there are some utility easements that cross through this property that were done for the benefit of Chancellor's Ridge. There's actually two sewer easements, uh, one on the south side of the property and one on the west side of the property um, that go through this, and it's and that was done for the benefit of Chancellor's Ridge and the, and the people, the majority of the people speaking. So I think that this, this previous landowner and the existing landowner have taken a lot of this into consideration. And uh, I, I just, I was not at the neighborhood meeting to address some of that, but I, I'm kind of, I'm disappointed that a lot of these folks didn't at least say that in the neighborhood meeting, but I understand timing. Um, as for the traffic on 751, um, uh, does DOT need to increase that? Absolutely. Uh, do we have power over that? Not at all. Um, we have access to 751, and in accordance with DOT and the planning department and transportation department, uh, we have agreed to the right in, right out, which makes the access um, as least impactful as possible and actually um, seven, uh, DOT made several mistakes when putting up the guardrail and actually had to change some of that for us. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the Corps of Engineers actually cut off access to this property for a, for a small time being um, in, in part of that, just, just to show you how much uh, the designation of this property has been all over the place. All right, should it have been open space? No, uh, never should have been. It was always residential and it was taken um, as part of the building of this dam. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, and then finally, we have John Paul Schick with his hand raised. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks, Mr. Chairman and uh, commissioners. I appreciate your time here tonight listening to all of us. Again, my name is John Paul Schick. Uh, I live at 308 Alumni Avenue, which is in Chancellor's Ridge. I've lived here uh, since 2014 with my wife and my two boys. I've lived in Durham since 1997. Um, by day, I am a real estate attorney with the firm of Ortiz and Schick. Um, I did attend the uh, neighborhood meeting where the presentation was put on about this development and uh, having practiced real estate and commercial real estate for many years, I can tell you that I was thoroughly unimpressed with the presentation. But uh, specifically, the reasons I oppose this application are the following. The number one reason is safety. Um, this driveway on 751, uh, so close to the traffic light at Stagecoach, so close to the entrance at Chancellor's Ridge, even with a right in, right out, I think is going to be a safety problem. Uh, not only the turning in and out at that driveway, but as somebody else mentioned, people that are going to want to make U-turns around whatever island is installed in front of that. Um, 751, as you've heard other people mention, is an issue. And I, I, I think that the safety of this entrance is, is, is huge, is paramount. 11 homes may not be a lot of cars, but all we need is one car to turn in or turn out wrongly. And then who knows what could happen. The uh, other reason I oppose this is it's a bad idea. Um, to the extent that we need new homes in the area, we've had over 100 units open north of this project at uh, South Point Trails. And of course, whether it's 1,000 or 1,200 or how many ever it is coming at 751 South, these 11 homes are a drop in the bucket, and I don't think we need that. Um, the uh, the Army Corps of Engineer property, yes, it does flood. I, too, have been down there with my boys. Um, I, I would like to address this idea that we uh, at Chancellor's Ridge are benefiting from easements. Uh, I, can, I can almost bet you donuts to a dollar that those easements were required by some of your predecessors from the city in building Chancellor's Ridge. So that although, yes, we benefit from these easements, I don't think Chancellor's Ridge had a choice in that matter. Um, and then finally, I've heard the hope that the pond will be saved and not paved. I've heard that hope in many, many, many other projects and the cost of, uh, of paving over it when you can put another house or two on it um, usually loses out. So I think the downside to this project, the very, the, the, the many downsides are far outweigh the upside of this project. And with that, I'll uh, thank you once again for your service to our community. Thank you.
Uh, if you have not spoken yet tonight, I see Caleb White's hand is up. I believe you've spoken already, but if, the, if you have not spoken and you wish to speak during this public comment period, please raise your hand and we will give you your opportunity. I don't see anyone else requesting to speak. So at this point, I will close the public hearing. And um, I'm seeing hands of folks who have already spoken. Uh, so we're gonna close the public hearing and we will move to comments by commissioners. And again, recognize the commissioners may ask questions of staff or proponents or even just folks who, who have spoken this evening. Uh, commissioners, if you can raise your hands, if you would like to speak and I will call on you. Uh, Commissioner Lowe, I see your hand raised. Would you, do, do you need, would you like to speak? Yes. Uh, this, one of the presenters, uh, I think it was Ms. Mavis James. I don't believe she gave her, gave us her address. At least I didn't catch it. Uh, I did not either, Mavis James. I know she signed up, but Mavis James, if you can provide your address, if you're able, that would be appreciated. Well, currently I do not live on 751. I live at um, 8 Caspian Court. Thank you. So I'm in the South Point area. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Lowe, any additional comments at this point? No, thank you. Thank you. I see um, Commissioner Johnson. Is that? And you're muted if, if you. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. All right, the floor is yours, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, I guess from my end, to start off on things, I would like to add, and we are able to ask questions at this point, right? to uh, Mr. Trans Terry. And so my first question is, uh, is a typical one I, I usually ask, and that can you provide us a, a sense of the, the price point for the residential units that are anticipated to be developed on this parcel? Uh, I haven't, I haven't uh, pinpointed a price point, but if I had to give a range, I would say uh, anywhere from, Five hundred to seven hundred thousand okay. dollars. And while you're still there, um, I'm sure you'll you'll likely be asked questions from others. But uh, just to start off with addressing some of the con the concerns that have been raised from uh, opposition to this request, can you uh, start off by just giving uh, us a sense of how you came up with the up to eleven units on this uh, small parcel and um, any any thoughts around like how will the actual program of the site in regards to green space and et cetera, anything that could be informative to us and how you will put up to 11 units on this small parcel and it still not just have a quality home, but overall quality of life uh, community that plugs into the surrounding community. Well, I, well, I was raised in, uh, I was raised in Southern Durham and uh, I've seen, you know, Southern Durham grow. Uh, I remember when there was no South Point there and it's grown now. It's, that's what the world we live in, you know, things are growing. But I will say that I plan to keep the pond. I think I think there'll be a nice feature. I have a little recreational area uh, just to the, my boundaries right, just to the south of the pond. Uh, have, a, have a nice little recreational, uh, keep the pond. Um, I just think uh, I, the up to 11 homes, to answer your question, sir, uh, that came from just working with uh, Mr. Cradle uh, as far as like what, what and actually, I believe work, yeah, working with Mr. Cradle, like how many houses would be allowed, you know, as far as density. Um, and I think it'd probably be closer to 10 just so the lot would be a small, but we, we still have to, like I said, we're very in, we're, we're in the early stages of this development. So uh, it might be, 11, but it possibly could be 10, uh, but I plan on keeping the pond. Thank you. And, and so just uh, just to be brief, for the sake of brevity,
brevity to start these, this uh, conversation off with my fellow commissioners. I will say that I am familiar with the South Point area and this particular um, uh, site and the growth in this area here. And uh, the concerns raised are, if you ask me, they are, um, they warrant attention. And the fact that this parcel is being asked to go from recreation and open space to basically a request that, you know, is not just from a back of the envelope numbers and what it probably will look like from a visual standpoint, it, it doesn't align naturally with what's currently there in, regard, in, in the sense that you take 2.8 acres and 10 or 11 units, you're talking about close to four units per acre. And so what does that mean with, with, with what else you can do on this site? And then the questions about the flooding and the, the traffic issues or whatnot. And so I do think that, you know, the concerns raised do warrant attention, not just from this commission, but uh, beyond this here, because, you know, there will be a quality of life. And yes, this is a small parcel, but this sets precedent about what can be made as arguments for why we continue to do things certain ways. And so me looking at this uh, application is like, one, there was there just doesn't seem to be enough um, uh, certainty included, like on, on the, the development plan to provide a better sense of what the neighboring communities can expect this overall project to look like. And I have other questions, but I'm pretty sure knowing my uh, fellow commissioners that you all will be asking some of them, so I'll, I'll wait to see what other questions and feedback uh, comes out of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, before we move to the other commissioners, I, if, is Ms. Suniak available? Because I did want to just uh, make sure that I understood the, uh, I, I believe I heard a, a commitment to preserve the pond, but I don't see that on the development plan. Is, is, am, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, uh, Jamie Suniak with the planning department. Yes, that's, that's correct. Currently there is no text commitment to, um, to preserve the pond, the building and parking envelope includes that area of the site. And, um, and while I'm speaking, I'll, I'll just also um, state for the record too, that there is a text commitment relative to the unit type. Um, the residential suburban multifamily does allow for a variety of different housing types. However, the, um, the applicant has committed to single family detached housing. Uh, so I just wanted to, to clarify that as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna call on the commissioners in the order you raised your hand. So Commissioner Al Turk is next. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks to everyone for uh, your feedback and, and being on this call. Uh, I think a lot of thoughtful comments. I, I agree with a lot of them. I agree with a lot of what Commissioner Johnson has already said. Um, let me ask, if I could just ask staff first a few questions. Um, I wanted to, uh, my, the first question is about the open space requirements uh, for, for a development like this. Uh, so this is an RSM, or the proposal is for, to change it to RSM. Is there, I mean, if I'm looking at UDO section 6.3.1, and is that correct? Am, am I correct in, in seeing that there are no open space requirements for this zoning designation? Um, and then how does that, well, I guess I'll let you answer that first and then. Yes, uh, again, Jamie Suniak with the planning department. I am also looking at the same table. I believe that you're referring to under 631 for the dimensional standards and there is not an open space percentage provided um, for the RSM. Uh, okay. Zoning district. But in in um, sheet C zero two zero zero in the in the development plan, I see in the development standards section here uh, open space. I don't know if you see that, and then it says eighteen point zero minimum. So is that? I mean, is that a commitment to preserve or to have eighteen percent? I assume for open space. Right. There's. Uh, I guess I should clarify, there's no maximum, the minimum is uh, 18%. Okay, so, so, so that, but is that minimum because the applicant has put that into the, the plan or is that somewhere else? 
Or is that no, um, on the, uh, I'll clarify again. On the um, dimensional standard chart within the um, RSM zoning district, there is a minimum standard for right. the zoning district. There is just not a max. Okay. I see. So that, that's the minimum, and, and that's what the applicant is is uh, committing to, I guess, right? Um, okay, so so the, the second question I had in that same section of the EDO 6.3.3, um, I see that there is a, um, in, sec in uh, section B of that 6.3.3, um, a density bonus for RSM. Do you think that that would apply because this is on a major roadway? I would assume uh, that would be designa designated a major road roadway. Um, do you think that would apply here? And is is that a site plan thing, or is that would that have to be approved in a development plan? Um, so we have not done an analysis to see whether or not that density bonus um, has is applicable here. However, if it is applicable, they do not have to identify that on their development plan, and that is something that they can uh, take advantage of at the time of site plan. Okay. I mean, from what I can tell, I mean, I, I guess I haven't done the analysis either, but um, okay. So it seems like it might be possible. Um, it, I, I could not answer that question. Okay. I don't know if they have enough frontage because um, there is a frontage requirement in terms of what they would need to maintain. So I, I do not know whether or not it's something that they would be able to take advantage of. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and, uh, so another question back to the open space um, requirement or, or, you know, this is, so this is currently uh, the flum here is open space and rec and rec and, and rec. Um, we don't typically see a lot of cases where we change it from that um, from that flum designation to low density or or you know residential. Um, it seems to me like I mean I guess we don't have any standards to say if we are going to take land out of this designation and, and make it residential, we it the it needs to satisfy some requirements or some, I mean, we have, we have, I assume as a county, you know, open space and tree save um, goals, right, but, but we don't have anything to, I mean, how would that align with some of the goals that we've discussed kind of re in recent cases about open space and tree preservation? Uh, yes, you're correct. We don't often see these types of requests. Um, in in fact, um, in many areas where we have the recreation open space designation, um, and we as staff, when we see the application, um, indicate that no development or certain types of development can't occur within that area. Um, when this application came in, um, there was a request to change the future land use designation and, um, and staff reviewed that request. Uh, typically we'll look at our, our GIS layers in terms of the environmental constraints on the site. Um, and in this case, when we pulled up the, um, when we pulled up the, the data, uh, there was not the FEMA floodplain area that would coincide with what we normally see as the recreation open space area. Um, in addition, the property was privately held. Um, so uh, staff um, came to the conclusion um, because the mapping in, in some cases uh, with respect to the future land use designation was done at such a, a large scale level um, that this was uh, considered a mapping error. Um, with that said, the applicant, um, you know, the property is currently uh, residentially zoned, so they could develop for uh, the property for residential purposes under the existing zoning. Um, however, with the request that came in um, with the, um, the application seeking um, a higher density than what's there right now, we reviewed the FLOM and, and felt that that uh, modification um, uh, made sense. Okay. Yeah, because currently it's zoned as RR, so they could build up to three single-family homes there, correct? Right. Um, 
I had a, a question for transportation as well. Um, the um, so transportation has requested um, in attachment eight a for the applicant to provide an offsite sidewalk, um, and and I guess the applicant has decided not to do that. Um, could you tell me exactly where you are requesting that? Is that I mean I see that it's along 751. But it's, I guess, not. It is not fronting their site, their parcel, or so. Can you clarify exactly where you're requesting um, that additional off-site sidewalk? Right, Berlin Thomas Transportation. Um, so this request was for the frontage of parcels, I believe, just to the south to avoid a gap in the sidewalk system. Okay, so just to the south. Okay, so kind of close to where there's that no build line riparian buffer on the development plan is that Correct. so it would it would connect with the existing sidewalk um, okay. to the Candler Street development okay thank you thank you yes great um, and then could I I also just have a couple of questions for the applicant um, so one of the one of the things that struck me about this is that it is zoned RSM or you're proposing to change it to RSM uh, which is confusing because that's multifamily, but you're also saying you only want to build 11 single family homes or you're committing to that. Um, but I assume part of the reason for that, uh, uh, Mr. Perry, is that you want to, you don't want some of the requirements or some of the restrictions on lot width maybe and lot area. Is that is that the primary reason that you chose this designation? Because it seems to me like an RS10 would make just as much sense here because it, it could get you up to four units an acre. Uh, could you explain why you're requesting an RSM zoning to the applicant? So, Mr. Perry, if you are able oh, okay. to unmute. Okay, yeah, I'll unmute. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I was. I was, you know, this is my first development. Like I said, I just done primarily residential in the downtown uh, area, a lot of infield lot. Uh, and I was just going by the recommendation, Mr. Fredo. Uh, originally, it was 16 townhomes, but I have not done townhomes, and I'm, 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 I've, I've, I've only done single family homes, and that's why I changed it during the, um, you know, during this whole process that I committed to just single family homes because that's what I know. And I don't want to step outside my comfort zone, if you will. Okay. Um, and 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 you've said that you want to commit or keep the pond. Would you? Are you willing to make that a, a commitment on the development plan? Yes, I believe. Uh, I was believe uh, that it's on. It, it's on the. It, it's on the plan, not the zoning plan. Uh, I believe. I believe I'm saying that right. I was talking to uh, Mr. Fravel, the civil engineer. That it's on the it's on one of the plans. It's not on the zone of them. That I want to I want to keep the pond. I think that's a great feature to the property. I mean, I I remember I remember when Mr. Carlton toured when he was alive. He took me around the property and he remember going in the pond and you know things of that nature. He told me took to me. So I plan on keeping the pond. Okay. C can we confirm that with staff that that is. I think plan long as I mean it should be able to keep it. I mean, you know, uh I don't see why I couldn't. Sorry about that. Uh yes, Jamie Turniak with the planning department. Um we we will accept the text commitment that will allow uh, um the um applicant to offer uh, committing to the fact that the pond will not be uh removed or um or modified. So I guess we I, I guess we would need some more specific language um, in terms of what exactly they're committing to. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll I guess we can see if an applicant wants to come up with more specific language. I'll just I I, I guess I can wrap up. Um, I've spoken a lot. I um, you know I I initially didn't like the RSM zoning here, but I but I thought about it and 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 one of the things that I I don't like about RS20 and RS10 is it 
the requirements for big lots. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, some of the neighbors said that this would not be in, in line with, with uh, the character of the, of the area, but I, you know, in my mind, you know, smaller lots are, are good in the long run because they can help us increase housing density while potentially protecting uh, and, and saving open space. So I have, I don't have quite an issue with maybe the smaller lots or the, even the number of, uh, of um, units. I, I'm not, you know, I think 3.9 units an acre is not wildly out of character with the area. However, having said that, I'm still, I feel like if this is, this was zoned or, and as an open space uh, piece of land and, you know, I, I feel like there should be a little bit more environmental protection, uh, so something above and beyond um, what is just required from the UDO. And so I, I feel like if the applicant would potentially, you know, put in some more environmental environmental protections, which I think is what a lot of folks have have discussed tonight, uh, I would be a little bit more prone to vote for it. I, right now, I'm still on the fence and I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what others say, um, but I, I kind of wish that there were some more environmental protections here. Um, and, and I would also love for the applicant to be able to build sidewalks offsite. I think that's a, that's especially when the transportation department is is echoing what uh, the bicycle and pedestrian advisory commission is is asking for, um, and so I'll I'll stop there. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Alter. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, you had your hand raised earlier. Do you have comment? And you're muted at the moment. Yeah, I know. I'm just just trying to find the right button to unmute. No, I I think uh, Commissioner Alter asked some of the same questions I had in mind, so that's why I've lowered it. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Durkin? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, I'm, I'm confused about whether there is actually a proffer regarding the pond. Um, planning to do something is not quite the same as committing to it. So if Mr. Perry can confirm whether or not it was an actual proffer or if it's something that he needs to confer with his um, engineer about, then it's either something we're bringing to the table now or, or not. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page on that. Uh, is that a question to Mr. Perry? It is, yes. If it's actually a proffer or if it's just an intention, but not a commitment. No, that's, it is a commitment. Uh, I, I don't see, I mean, I'm not, I think, I think that'd be, a better question for Mr. Cradle, but I've expressed to him that I want to keep it. I'll let him answer uh, if we if we can keep it. I, I don't know. It might be some regulations with the city. I'm not sure, but I'm sure I think Mr. Cradle's still on. Yeah, he's there. Muted. So if you could answer that question, Mr. Cradle. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and concern. We will have to look at the actual outlet to the pond since this was man-made. We have to make sure that the outlet is safe for um, for this kind of uh, development and it meets all of the state standards. Uh, typically, these older ponds do not. So I don't want to commit to not modifying the pond, but if Mr. Perry wants to keep the pond, then we will commit to the pond. Um, also, part of the designation of this being RSM was to keep these environmental features all over the site and give us the flexibility with the houses as opposed to the RS20 or RS10 designation. Because um, we do have tree coverage area on this site. We've got screen buffers on this site. We've got uh, boundary buffers against both the core land and the open space that's associated with Chancellor's Ridge. And that kind of cuts everything into what would be smaller lots. Uh, the purpose of this was to build the houses so that we kept all the environmental features in addition to these uh, two large uh, sewer things that uh, go through the lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So just we're, we're not putting, there's not a proffer on the table for tonight which I think is the right move because it seems like a, a big commitment to make right now without really factoring in sort of the feasibility of that. 
And I did have a question for staff, I think. Um, one of the concerns, well, many of the concerns were environmental related issues. And one question that came up that I wanted to make sure was answered was what kind of environmental requirements or testing are required at the site plan stage? Since this is just a development plan, it doesn't lay out the actual footprints of the houses or anything with a whole lot of great detail. So at that stage, what is required that the developer will have to uh, in, undertake and pass those whatever requirements are required? Um, Jean Cognac with the planning department. In terms of the testing, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, are you referring to something specific? If there's an EIS or if there's what they can do with the pond and with the sewer easements and the concerns about flooding, if there are things that will be done at the site plan stage that would address some of those concerns. Okay. Um, I believe if, it, if the um, commission doesn't mind, um, Mike Irwin uh, and others mm -hmm. from Stormwater may be on the call to better help answer questions related to uh, stormwater at the site plan level? Yeah, that would be really helpful. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commission. My name is Michael Earl, and I'm an engineer with the Stormwater Development Review Section. Um, in regards to this, this parcel, um, they are going to need some sort of a stormwater control measure. So um, I would recommend that this pond be available for retrofit um, without, you know, having any more in in engineering survey data from Mr. Cradle. I wouldn't know what the current situation of the pond is. There's also sections of the site that are down slope from this pond because there's a ridge in the middle of the property. So I don't know how they're going to get the water from the south side of the, the or from, sorry, from the west side of the development and back up to the pond. So I may need some other sort of a stormwater control measure on the site. But keeping the pond right now appears to be a viable alternative for stormwater treatment. Okay, just so it's clear for everybody, the attendees, that there are stormwater abatement measures that have to be undertaken at site that are not reflected on this development plan. Oh, and most definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yes, mo most definitely, yes. They have to go okay. through the whole um, pipe plan stormwater impact analysis where they talk about the uh, creek flow runoff and uh, whether it's just going to be solid treatment or, or any other of our regulatory requirements. Um, and it's usually a document that is greater than 60 pages long. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Durkin. Uh, before I recognize Commissioner Kenshin, I did just want to note that Commissioner Miller has joined the meeting. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we are uh, on the Fox Place agenda item and in the Commissioner question and comment section. Uh, Commissioner Kenshin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, most of my questions have been answered already. I do have a couple more for the owner, Mr. Terry. Uh, I'm curious, it looks like there's no other access points other than 751. Is that correct? That's the only access to the property, 751. And then also, Mr. Cradle in his letter to the city said the price point would be 325 per unit. But I think I heard you say 500 to 750, which is a pretty big difference from what we saw. And then lastly, um, why no sidewalks? Um, I mean, you're asking a lot from us in terms of making concession to turn this space into something that works for you, but you said no to sidewalks. I'm curious about what the rationale is for saying no to the sidewalks. Those are my three questions for Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry, you're welcome to answer the questions. What, what was the first, what, all right, the first, the, the side, I forget, the first question I was. The first uh, question the, is, I, I don't, there doesn't appear to be any access points other than 751. Oh, There's no right. way to connect to the, to the other neighborhoods. Um, so yeah, you've only got the one way to access the property, which is which appears to be a really tough turn, from my vantage point at least. So I was wondering about that. If that's correct, if, am I reading that correctly? Or if I yes, that's correct. That's correct. One 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 uh, entrance. 
Uh, and the sound walk is, you know, I, you know, I have, I think it's, I don't have the map in front of me. Uh, uh, I think it only have about 70, 60 or 70 feet of frontage. So, I mean, that's, I mean, w- w- I mean, I, I, I don't commit to a sidewalk. I mean, I guess if it's feasible for the 60 or 70 feet, but I, I, I don't know if I feel like they want me to take it all the way to Chancellor's Ridge. That's crossing over, you know, uh, Army Corps, another, another property. So that's why, you know, we said, you know, that's why we, that's why I said south, no, no sidewalk all the way to the Army Corps, I mean, all the way to the Chancellor's Ridge uh, sidewalk. Can, can I chime in on that one? Uh, yes, please. All right, so the sidewalk, uh, which is required across the frontage of our site, which is 60 feet, and then going to the south of it, which is hundreds of feet, also has a, um, grade difference of over 20 feet. So the sidewalk would actually be out of sight down in the bottom, which belongs to the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which is also in a stream buffer. So development of that would actually hinder and, um, and cause more environmental issues than it would resolve. A nicer sidewalk would be actually from the back of the site to uh, the open space through Chancellor's Ridge. Thank you. And the only other question was about the price point. Again, I saw the letter from oh, yeah. Creole indicating 25, but I think I heard you say somewhere between 500 and 750, uh, which is far from. I mean, we need middle housing in Durham. Um, 500 is far from that. 325 is not that much better, but it is better. So, what is it going to be? Is it 325 in the letter, or is it 500 to 750 that you indicated earlier? Five to 750. It'll be five to 750. Uh, extra attention. Uh, any other commissioner? Commissioner Miller, I see your hand raised. I want to give other commissioners just a final moment. That's fine. Any other commissioners? Uh, raise your hand actually or virtually if you'd like to speak. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Uh, so, actually, looking at this project, and to what Commissioner Al Turk was saying earlier in terms of we need density. Um, the issue with this is we're creating density with 11 homes between $500,000 and $700,000. And I don't think that that's actually density that Durham needs. Not to mention the concerns that the people in this area have. Because they live there daily, I don't think anyone can necessarily say whether or not their property will or will not flood. And because these people aren't just five or six year residents. Most of them that spoke are 15 to 20 to 30 year residents. Um, I have concerns as I always have. Impervious surfaces always create way more runoff than uh, grass surfaces do. My other concern is there seems to be a little bit of disconnect between the engineer and the owner. So I've got an engineer saying that he doesn't want to commit to saving a pond, it's man-made but I have an owner that wants to save the pond. So I think that there's a miscommunication there, which may present further hurdles with this project going forward. I have issues as far as the runoff, how that will be contained, whether or not uh, watershed will actually be an issue within our UDO of retention pond is mandatory for new construction. And there's a concern of how the water will move uphill by nature without some type of mechanical unit. Water tends to flow downhill. So if there is any possibility that less properties could be developed on this same lot, I think it would be met with less resistance and there still could be an addition to the area. I definitely have uh, Commissioner Kenshin's concerns with a letter stating $325,000 and then a price point of over half a million to almost three quarters of a million dollars, a major difference. Um, but that didn't seem to be the concern of the residents was the price, excuse me, the price point, whether they were unaware or not. It was more so about the traffic, the safety, and what that's going to look like on the impact of those that already live there. And if nothing else has shown up, is that the community has a greater voice than the few. 
and there's a lot of resistance to this and the commentary or the resistance to this appears to be consistent in the flooding issue. Flooding has gotten a lot worse. The majority of Durham is built in a floodplain and some homes have managed to escape that. But over time with us building in consistent areas and adding on to infrastructures that cannot support certain structures or overbuilding, I think we're continuing to add to the issues of flooding. In 751, Jordan Lake, what happens when there's massive rains and the Army Corps of Engineers or, you know, different aspects have to release uh, rates from Jordan Lake? Like, what does that look like? Um, I know specifically growing up in Southern Durham, I know exactly what that's like. I've traveled 751, and it's not much different than traveling Highway 54 heading into Chapel Hill on a busy, busy day. So even though 11 homes may not seem like a lot right now, the continuous structure of what Mr. Perry traditionally builds are quite a few homes in a seemingly small area with short driveways. And I would assume that these people would entertain. So traffic will definitely increase right in, right out. And just looking at the overall plan, Mr. Perry does exceptional work. But I do think that the concerns in this area are valid. And I think that they go well beyond just looking at the number of lots and looking at density. I think that the concern of during construction building, construction equipment in this area during the course of building the entire uh, subdivision, I think those are all very valid concerns, at least as far as I'm concerned. I definitely have issues when it comes to flooding and runoff. That's my comments. Okay, thank you, Commissioner West. Uh, Commissioner Miller, I don't see any other hands raised. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Tom Miller um, speaking. And I apologize to everyone for being late. This is my actually first time ever to be late to a planning commission meeting in the last six years. Um, I have met with the neighbors here and I've studied the staff report and I've looked at the development plan. And quite frankly, in all my time on the commission, this is the only case that I can remember where we've been asked to pull a property entirely out of land designated open space and recreation on the future land use map to make it available for development. We have from time to time been asked to adjust borders here and there uh, and for uh, and in some of those cases, for really good stated reasons, I may have supported that. But this is extraordinary to me. Um, and I will acknowledge that all around the Jordan Lake watershed, we have allowed development that uh, wise planning uh, says we should not have allowed. Some of it we have been compelled to do after resisting mightily. And I was part of that resistance in, in one capacity or another. Uh, I am disinclined uh, to even for 2.81 acres or for 11 single family homes, so small a change, uh, to vote in favor of reducing uh, land designated as open space and recreation uh, in the future land use map for a property that is so close to uh, the reservoir, which soon we will be drinking from. Uh, and quite frankly, our ability to grow and develop as a community in other places more suited for growth and development is dependent upon our ability to keep Jordan Lake the best drinking water source we can. Uh, it has not been so long ago that the newspapers covered the ridiculous efforts by the McCrory administration to float uh, devices in the lake uh, to help remediate some of its dreadful problems uh, with uh, water quality. Um, it, sure, it seems like this is just a little project and what difference can it make? Uh, but we are killing Jordan Lake using the death by a thousand cuts. Uh, I will not wield the knife even for so small a cut. I'm going to vote against this. Um, even if we were to approve the, uh, the future land use map, map change, uh, this is uh, a development plan with so few commitments, I don't have a very clear vision 
of what this development's going to look like. And although I'm sure you have covered it in my absence, uh, why we're using a multifamily designation to build 11 single family homes, I'm deeply troubled by that as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman. I'll be ready to vote when. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Uh, this is a final chance if any commissioners would like to speak, if you can virtually raise your hand. Uh, while we wait, I will just also echo the concerns raised by many of the commissioners, and uh, I plan to vote no when there are motions made on this item. I don't see any additional hands at this point, so I would ask for uh, entertain a motion. If I may then, Mr. Chairman, Tom Miller speaking. You may. In connection with case A1900004, I move that uh, this item be sent forward to the City Council of Durham with a favorable recommendation. Second. Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk, and we'll have a roll call vote. Yes, I apologize for the glare. I'm trying to get out of the sun. Um, uh, Commissioner Williams? No. Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Amendolia? No. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Al Turk? No. Chair Busby? No. Commissioner Landry? No. Commissioner Keenchin? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? No. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Okay, the motion fails 11-1. I'm sorry, 111. Mr. Thank Chair, uh, uh, my name was not called in the roll call. Oh, sorry, because I forgot you showed up. So that's why I got 111. It should be 112. Commissioner Miller. No, please. Okay. I knew my math wasn't adding up correctly. Thank you for ca calling me out on that. So it failed 112. Thank you. She skipped me earlier this evening, Commissioner Miller. So you're I in know. good job. I'm falling out on my job. I apologize. And I'll entertain a motion on the zoning case as well, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, in connection with case Z1900005, I move that we send this item forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. And we'll have the roll call vote, please. Yes. Um, Commissioner McIver. Yes. And Commissioner Lowe. No. Commissioner Baker? No. And Commissioner Kinchin? No. Commissioner Miller? See, I wasn't ready. No. Sorry. Commissioner Landfried? No. Commissioner, uh, Chair Busby? No. Commissioner Al Turk? No. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Amendolia? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Williams? No. Okay, motion fails one to 12. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith, before we move to our next item, you had mentioned an interest uh, given the length of tonight's meeting and the large crowd assembled a potential break at some point. Yes, um, this might be a good time to take a quick recess and start back up at 730 if everyone is okay with that. We don't need a vote. We just need a consensus. Okay, I okay. would agree. All right, we'll see you at 730. And commissioners and attendees, you can just go mute and go off video and come back in 10 minutes.
All right, good job, everyone. 7.30, you are here. Uh, let me just check and make sure that the staff is here so we can keep, keep uh, records for the minutes. Okay. We will move to the next item on our agenda. And next up is the Chin Page Road case. And this is uh, case A19 quadruple zero one eight and concurrent case Z19 triple zero five zero. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening again. It's Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting the consolidated land use items for Chin Page Road. Uh, first slide, please. Um, the agent for the application is um, Bob Zingwald from McAdams. The property is located, uh, there are several properties on the north side of Chin Page Road, generally located at 5203. Um, the site is located within the city's jurisdiction. Um, it is located within the suburban tier. The request for this application, again, is uh, to change the future land use designation of the site to office and change the zoning of the site to office and institutional. Um, there is a um, request for a street zoning of the property. There is no development plan um, associated uh, with this site. Um, just as a little background, which has been included in the staff report, um, this property is a remnant track uh, that remains after the adjacent property, which is about 37 acres in size, um, was purchased. Uh, that 37 acre track is subject to a development plan, which is legacy case Z07-21. Um, that requires the construction of Crown Parkway along the Eastern property line. Uh, that development plan was for the FedEx facility uh, to accommodate that site. And um, my understanding is there was uh, a land swap between ownership groups and, and this property resulted in that. Next slide, please. The property um, is highlighted in red. Um, it's roughly eight acres in size. The next um, photos depict uh, the context of the area and, um, and uh, uh, site to the north uh, appearing to uh, get to the site. Next slide, please. There is, um, just to give a context of the area, there is the Republic Services Recycling Facility, um, a church, an approved office park, again, for the FedEx, as I mentioned before, and an auto repair service um, facility to the west, directly to the north and east, is the Creekside at Bethpage Residential Development. Um, across Chimpage Road to the south are additional residential developments, which extend to Page Road. Um, along to the west along Chin Page Road and Chronicle Drive is Beth Page Office, uh, which includes a pending zoning map change from ILD to, um, to OI with no development plan. Next slide, please. The context map uh, shows the property, um, the existing zoning on the left and the office and institutional zoning on the right. Next slide, please. Future land use designation, the property is currently um, industrial and the applicant is proposing to change it to office to coincide with the zoning request. Next slide. Um, in terms of the comprehensive plan policies, the proposed zoning is not consistent with the future land use designation of industrial, but the applicant is seeking a modification to be consistent. Um, staff has reviewed the industrial land use study and determined that this property is not suitable for the industrial designation, um, given its size and the proximity to the residentially zoned land. Um, as shown on the context map and then described in the staff report, the current industrial future land use designation does not serve as an appropriate transition between the residentially zoned land to the north and east. Um, staff has uh, determined that the office um, designation is more consistent and more compatible with the adjacent land uses. 
um, and that the requested um, office will allow for more complementary transitional uses to be de developed on the subject site, um, resulting in more compatibility with the surrounding properties and allowing for a more um, cohesive overall development with the Bethpage community. Um, staff, staff did express concerns in the SAC report um, that without a development plan, however, there is no way to address any potential impacts or mitigating factors associated with being adjacent to an industrial or low medium density future land use designation. Um, and uh, staff also wanted to note that um, the site will have access through adjacent lots, therefore it does not meet the intent of policy 252E. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The staff determines that um, the requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies, except where I have uh, been noted. I will, I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sonia. We're gonna open the public hearing. We have four people who signed up in advance, all are proponents. And so, um, I'll just read their names off and then we'll provide, uh, since they're all proponents, they can have a total of 10 minutes unless we determine to, to change the rules and then we can see if there's anyone else who would like to speak on the item. Uh, Ms. Smith? I can keep time. I was just letting you know. I can split it into two and a half minutes each or just they can just talk and I can track it as they go either way. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I'll just read off the names. They may have a plan on how they'd like to proceed. We have Patrick Baker, Rob Griffin, Kevin Walls, and Bob Zumwalt. I'm, I'm present. Rob Griffin here. Patrick Baker here. I'll probably be the main speaker, followed by Mr. Walls, and then I think our team will be happy to answer any questions and hopefully take a lot less than 10 minutes. That's great. You may proceed, Mr. Baker. Good evening, Chairman Busby, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing Tri Properties for this agenda item. For those of you who have been on the Planning Commission for at least a year, I'm pretty sure this item will be deja vu all over again. We had a practically identical case on your September 2019 agenda. Back then, that case was for 23 acres, whereas tonight's agenda item only covers about nine acres. By way of introduction, I'd like to give some historical background on the overall Bethpage project located here along Shimpage Road. It's been my privilege to work with Tri Properties on the Bethpage development for the past 14 years. Back in 2006, Tri Properties was our lead office and industrial developer for Bethpage, an assemblage that amounted to 450 acres located pretty close to RTP and RDU Airport. Pursuant to what we designed and what was approved about 14 years ago, the residential section of Beth Page has been built out as an age-restricted community called Creekside, which represents a great neighborhood here in Durham. Unfortunately, the office and industrial section of Beth Page has languished for the most part since it was approved unanimously by the Durham County Board of Commissioners. Back then, the Board of County Commissioners consisted of Becky Heron, Shannon Reckow, Lewis Peak, Bill Cousin, and Michael Page. I recall Commissioner Becky Heron being very insistent that the Beth Page team create enough acreage zoned IL to accommodate around 1 million square feet of space, and that is what we did. Back then, before the Great Recession, before the Great Recession, we thought Durham needed a large swath of IL zoned property to compete for a major corporate headquarters. Well, the world certainly has changed since then. Given that the IL zoning on the 8.8 .8 acres we are talking about tonight allows for either office or industrial uses, we wish to rezone these 8.8 .8 acres to allow for either office or multifamily. We think that is a better fit to the adjacent Creekside neighborhood, neighborhood and it allows Tri Properties as the leading office developer in Durham to continue marketing this site for office use. Next, what I'd like to discuss briefly is our team's decision not to submit a development plan with this zoning map change to OI. Again, going back 14 years, our team, our team undertook a massive TIA for Beth Page covering over 400 acres. The Beth Page TIA as part of that development plan runs with the land as part of the zoning. 
That TIA accounted for potentially high peak hour traffic generation from these 8.8 .8 acres and any use allowed under the OI zoning district contemplated in tonight's agenda item would be equal to or more likely less than what we accounted for in the original TIA. In fact, the staff report states that the anticipated traffic generation will be reduced by about 2,600 trips per day. Also, since Tri Properties does not have an end user at this time, it's impossible to scope a traffic uh, impact analysis. Keep in mind, Durham City ordinances, including but not limited to the UDO, place limits on this site in regards to noise, lighting, building height no more than 50 feet, and pretty significant boundary buffers under UDO section 9.4 to give uh, the neighbors comfort for this rezoning without a development plan. For all these reasons, we respectfully request your recommendation of approval, and now I'll turn it over to Mr. Kevin Wall. Uh, so I'm kind of representing a, a lot of the uh, residents of Creekside at Beth Page. I've been a resident there now, for just coming up onto five years, uh, one of the original residents. And uh, we've been speaking positive to change all these uh, incendiary parcels around us from industrial to office industrial. We understand the uses. Uh, we've covered that uh, several times. And uh, multifamily or even office fits in the design that was, was originally presented to us when we purchased here in 2015. So that's why I'm here to just speak positive to that. Uh, I'm on several uh, committees and councils here uh, within the subdivision. And I think that the majority of the people here are, uh, is who I'm speaking for. So that'll be the end of my statement. Uh, Mr. Walls, could you give us your mailing address, please? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Kevin Walls, 1027 Branwell Drive, uh, Durham. Thank you. And uh, any additional comments, uh, Rob Griffin or Bob Zumwalt? Um, hi, Rob Griffin uh, speaking. I'm a Raleigh resident, 4901 Glen Forest Drive in Raleigh. Um, representing tribe properties and the owner of the site. Uh, the site has uh, some severe topo issues. Um, uh, if uh, the site were to connect both to the planned Creekside um, Phase 5 as well as Crown Parkway, that's approximately 30 plus feet of topo would have to deal with over a relatively short, short distance to connect the two. Uh, going to an OI uh, zoning, gives the site a little more flexibility for a smaller footprint, uh, more more nimble building footprints. Um, <clears throat> they could be anything from office building to townhomes to be in keeping with, uh, with Creekside. Um, and we just think it, it makes the overall site more marketable, provides a much greater transition for the residential between Creekside and the IL zoning, both the Republic and the new FedEx facility going in. Um, it just it really fits the transitional nature of uses, I think, to Mr. Walls' point, far better than having the IL right up against the current residential zoning. Thank you. And Bob Zumwalt, would you like to speak as well? Uh, no, I'm just here to answer questions. I appreciate it. I'll just mute myself. Thank you. Thank you. So those are the individuals who signed up. If you are in attendance and you would like to speak during the public hearing, if you could just raise your hand virtually and we will provide you the opportunity to speak. I don't see anyone else raising their hand. I'll give it one more moment. No one else is stepping forward, so we will close the public hearing. And commissioners, if you can raise your hands, I'll call on you. I'll start with Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for staff, if I may. Um, in a uh, district to district zone like this with office institutional against a PDR, what 
is the base requirement for the buffer in terms of width and opacity. And I realize that there would be alternatives under the interactive buffer model and also using a berm or uh, a hedge. Let me, um, Mr. Miller, let me look that up for you um, while I don't have that number off the top of my head, but <clears throat> pulling up the uh, chart now. So if the property is in um, the OI district uh, and is adjacent to a PDR in the suburban tier, it would either be a 0.4 or 0.6 opacity, which would um, require... And if I may, um, what would the width be? That's what I was going to get to just. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, the it would either be a 20 foot or a 30 foot width. And if it's 20 feet for feet, it would be a six. No, the uh, 20 feet uh, coincides with the point four. Okay. What if it's 30 feet? That would coincide with point six. Really? That's correct. In other words, the narrower it gets, the less opaque it, it has to be. Why would anybody have 30 feet? You, yeah, can, only do the thir you can only do the less, uh, the, the smaller limit if the adjoining property has already provided a buffer, which the previous best page zoning, I can check it. I think it's a 20 foot, but I can check that. Okay, I get it now. So if there's a buffer on the other side. That's right. Right. Okay. But it it and so but we're looking at a 0.4 opacity, and what's the height limit for buildings in a straight OI in this situation? Let me. I believe I put that in the staff report, but I will. I'm sorry. Um, I, you probably did. I apologize. That's okay. Just bear with me, and I'll pull it up again. Uh, 50 feet. Right. So, Mr. Chair and, and, and my colleagues on the commission, I intend to vote for this, uh, but I would prefer to be voting for it with a development plan that had at least some commitments uh, improving uh, the, the transition quality of this property against the uh, residential next door. I believe that the uh, buffer requirements are really not adequate if we are operating on a property that could have buildings as tall as 50 feet. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, since I see this as an incremental improvement over the industrial zoning that's on the property, and because the neighbors actually favor this rezoning, I'll be voting uh, for it. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. My dog seconds your motion, apparently. Uh, other commissioners who would like to speak, you may raise your hand. I don't see any others. I'll, I'll also just echo Commissioner Miller. I voted for something similar as, as uh, Mr. Biker mentioned. Um, I'd rather have the development plan as well, but I believe moving from, uh, from, from the current zoning to the, the proposed zoning is a step in the right direction and hearing the neighbors are supportive gives me comfort to support this. Any final thoughts, commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Baker. I'll just say one thing real quick that, um, you know, I think I think both of these zoning districts by themselves uh, are unsustainable sprawl. Um, and so I don't I don't see a major consequence uh, in uh, in approving, uh, you know, vo voting to recommend approval of a change in the zoning map. Um, especially given the fact that, uh, that some of the adjacent uh, residents are in favor. Thank you. If there are no other comments from commissioners, I will entertain the first of two motions on this item. Mr. Chair, I move in connection with case A19-00018, the property at Chin Page Road, 
that we send the future land use map amendment forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Al Turk, and we'll have a roll call vote, please. Um, Commissioner Williams. Yes. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Amadolia. Yes. Commissioner Darkin. Yes. Commissioner Al Turk. Yes. Chair Busby. Commissioner Langfried. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Uh, yes, please. Commissioner Clinton. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Lowe. Yes. And Commissioner McIver. Yes. It passes uh, 13 0 unanimous. Thank you. And we'll take a motion on the zoning case as well. Mr. Chair, in connection with case Z1900050, the property at Chin Page Road, uh, I move that we send this rezoning request forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Seconded. A move by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Morgan, and the roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Yes. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Amendolia. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. Yes. Commissioner Al Turk. Yes. Chair Busby. Yes. Commissioner Landfried. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Kinchin. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Lowe. Yes. Commissioner McIver. Yes. Passes unanimous three, um, 13 to zero. Thank you. We will move to our next two cases, our zoning map change proposals. The first is Carrington Woods 2, and this is case Z19000037. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Karniak again with the planning department. Um, cover sheet says Carrington Woods. Let's just make sure it's the correct PowerPoint. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? I, I believe that's the right case. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, the applicant uh, agent is Glenwood Homes, LLC. The property is located at 833 Clayton Road. It is pending an annexation petition. Um, the property is just under nine acres. It's located within the suburban sphere. The applicant is seeking a rezoning request to um, residential suburban 10 with a development plan or up to 23 single family lots. There is no um, future land use map amendment associated with this development. Next slide. Property is highlighted in red. Um, it is heavily wooded. There are a number of easements that are shown um, on the plan as well as an existing wetland on the property. Next slide. The um, pictures depict the uh, properties. Uh, the property and the area to the east and west contains mostly uh, residential subdivisions, twin lakes, and woodland parks, specifically both re uh, zoned at the RS-10 level. Um, most of those homes were constructed in the 1990s on uh, 10,000 square foot lots. Um, additionally, you'll see on the uh, aerial as well as the development plan, there are three street sub stubs from these subdivisions, um, two which will be which will require connections from those developments um, to the site. Uh, Southern High School is found just northeast of the property. Uh, next slide, please. Just those are additional photos of the area. Next slide. Um, this site is located within the suburban tier. It's also within the Falls Jordan Lake Watershed Protection Overlay District. Um, you'll see the existing zoning on the left. 
and the proposed RS-10 zoning on the right. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide depicts the existing um, future land use designation as low density residential, which is consistent with the application. Next slide. And um, this slide shows the development plan, which has been included in the staff report. It shows the access points, pre coverage areas, and the project boundary buffers, um, as well as the density and the unit type. Next slide. Um, in terms of key commitments, the applicant has committed to single family detached um, as the permitted building type, restricted the number of units to be a max of. 23, and then they provided also a um, project boundary buffer along the property boundaries um, where one is not required under the um, UDO. Next slide. Uh, in addition, there are graphic commitments um, discussed on the development plan, including a variety of roof types, building materials, and a requirement for covered front entries. Next slide. The proposed zoning is consistent with the future land use designation um, of low density residential, which is consistent uh, with this request. Uh, the proposal is consistent with the other policies that have been included on this screen and further detailed in the staff report. Next slide. And staff determines that these um, that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, we appreciate it. Uh, we'll open the public hearing. We had six individuals sign up in advance, two proponents and four opponents. Uh, if, uh, if it makes sense to fellow commissioners, that seems still fair to me to operate with 10 minutes per side. Uh, that would give each of the opponents more time than we actually gave the opponents in the earlier case of two and a half minutes per opponent. So I see heads nodding. So let, let's proceed. Uh, we have Penny Sakalva yes. and Garrick Sevilla signed up to speak in support. Uh, yes, good evening. This is Garrick Sevilla. Um, uh, Penny and I are, are working together on this. Uh, I was planning to give a statement, uh, maybe take five minutes, maybe less. And uh, Penny can either correct me after I'm done or, um, or say some additional uh, remarks if she wishes. Does that sound good to you, Penny? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, you may proceed. That sounds good. Okay, great. Uh, like I said, I'm Derek Savi. I'm an attorney. I represent the uh, applicant here, Glenwood Homes. About two years ago, the Planning Commission uh, considered uh, Glenwood Homes' request for a straight rezone of the same property from RS-20 to RS-10. Uh, there was no development plan uh, submitted with that, and the commission did not recommend approval, and the concerns that were expressed at that time fell into really three, three categories. One was the absence of a development plan that limited the number of units and showed the, uh, the subdivision configuration with a little more clarity. Uh, the second bucket of concerns is really just the traffic impact along Clayton Road and through the adjacent subdivisions. And finally, there was some concern about uh, disturbance of wetlands that, um, that are on the site. Um, the, uh, the case went to the city council in December of 2018 and uh, it voted to, to deny the application. Uh, so Glenwood went back to the drawing board and we created a development plan uh, to address many of the concerns uh, that we could. And so now we're back uh, before the city with requests to rezone again from RS-20 to RS-10. Uh, but we have a development plan list uh, this time. As Ms. Suniak covered, uh, the plan uh, you know, limits the maximum number of units to 23. Building type has been limited to single family detached residences. And we have an update on the, the sale price. Um, we expect to sell these at about 250,000 per home. When we submitted the annexation petition in August of last year, we'd estimated uh, 225, but prices have gone up. Uh, the plan also proposes three access points. There are stubs, as Ms. Uh, Suniak alluded to, one on Meadowcrest Drive to the east, Alpha Drive to the west, and Dairy Road to the south. 
Um, last time there was an issue about whether there could be a separate entrance to the site from Clayton Road, the idea being that uh, the, the new residents of this, of this uh, subdivision would not you know, need to um, drive through the existing neighborhood. And I, I would just uh, point out that the, it was the opinion of Mr. Bill Judge with the, with the transportation group and also of Ms. Cadlow, uh, our design engineer, that NCDOT would not permit such an entrance. And so the only access options to this site really are the, the three uh, existing roads that are stuck to this site. Uh, the plan also shows uh, the precise location of the wetlands and the amount that, um, that can be disturbed. And the amount of disturbance, um, we, we minimized it to just fit the road that we planned to connect to Dairy Road to the south. And the area of disturbance is so small that we don't expect the state, um, the state water resources division to require any, any wetland mitigation. Um, so we've, we've, we've done our best to try to, to, uh, to, mit uh, to minimize the disturbance. And uh, you know, also I just wanna point out that uh, Glenwood went beyond what was required uh, of the development plan by including a, a boundary buffer uh, along the perimeter of the property. Uh, it's 25 feet in places where uh, we plan to include tree coverage and then it's 10 feet in areas where there will be no, no tree coverage. Um, and I, you know, I just want to note that this boundary buffer um, was included after we had met with the, um, the residents in September of last year. Uh, after submitting the application, we notified all of the owners on the list that we received from Ms. Suniak. I believe it's all, all owners within 600 feet. And 10 residents uh, came to the meeting venue, which was the, uh, the East Regional Library. Uh, near the site off of Lick Creek Road. And we shared with them the initial draft of, of this development plan that's, that's on the screen. And uh, we also shared a sketch subdivision plan, which is just kind of our concept for how uh, we plan to subdivide the site consistent with the development plan under consideration. Uh, the sub that sketch was very similar to the one that uh, Glenwood had shared with the uh, residents uh, about two years ago. It was my impression at that meeting that you know the attendees were, were largely appreciative of the commitments made on the development plan, specifically you know the limit on the number of units and some more clarity around access and how wetland disturbance would would um, you know how, how that would unfold. Uh, there were still concerns about traffic, however, just to be completely um, completely candid. Uh, and as to that, all I can really say is you know I'd ask the commission to find that. Uh, under current zoning, 15 units can be built. Um, you know, we would still have the issue of interconnection to the three hubs that um, that uh, uh, that that stub at the property. And so, really, the the traffic impact I think needs to focus on what the intermittent increase um, on traffic is going from 15 to to 23 units. And I, I'll just highlight that according to the staff report, um, the increase. Uh, in units, it's projected to add just 87 uh, vehicle trips per 24-hour period. Now, just to put that in context, that's about you know a one percent increase in in, in traffic um, the volume that's in the report, uh, which it looks from the footnote that it was measured in, in 2017. Um, you know, as for traffic um, that will go through the existing neighborhoods, you know, as to that, I would just say that there are three different access points that will interconnect. Um, the three roads to the site, and those will all, um, you know, share the, uh, you know, share those 87 daily trips. Um, you know, we're not dismissing the concerns about traffic. We're not saying that they're completely insignificant or won't be felt. It's just that, you know, our view is that the impact um, isn't substantial enough to deny the, the rezone, particularly when it's uh, consistent with the uh, future use designation, um, and you know the surrounding neighborhoods are all zoned uh, RS10. Um, so in reaching a decision, I, I hope that the commission will um, uh, recognize the efforts that Glenwood Homes has made at transparency and, and communicating with the uh, the residents, and in efforts to you know exceed the minimum requirements um, in an effort to address uh, the, the residents' concerns. And so, uh, in sum, you know we just ask that the commission favorably recommend. Uh, this proposed zoning map change uh, to the city council. Thank, Thank you. you.
and and Penny Cicadlo, if you have any additional comments. Well, I think Derek covered it uh, very well. Uh, I do want to state as an engineer, it does seem logical to connect all the roads, connect all the utilities, all the sewer, all the water. We'll now have our circulation pattern through this subdivision. Uh, it is designed to match what is in the surrounding area and appears to be a legitimate request for rezoning. Thank you. And as I said, we have four individuals who signed up and listed themselves as opponents, Joe Peck, Quincy Ratcliffe, Denise Reeves, and Kenneth Wiggins. And so Joe, if, uh, Mr. Peck, if you're with us, we'll let you start and each of you have up to two and a half minutes. Joe Peck, are you with us? You can raise your hand or you can star nine to unmute yourself. I see Quincy Ratcliffe. We'll move to Quincy Ratcliffe. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, first and foremost, I would like to say to Mr. Savila, Thank you for the clarity in which you expressed this evening with the site plan that you have. Um, we wish, as the neighbors and the ones who live in these areas, we wish that was shared with us prior to this meeting. Um, but he has done a good job with sharing the information that we have asked for since 2018. Um, now, I guess you need some background for me. Do you still want that or just go ahead and move in? Uh, we would love for you, uh, if you can share your name and you've already gave us your name, your address and please share your thoughts about the proposal over the next two minutes or so. Okay, my name is, again, my name is Quincy Radcliffe. My address is 3219 Woodland Park Road. I live at the corner, um, which is direct, which is the main entrance to dairy, to the Carrington Woods entrance, which is Dairy and Woodland Park Road. Um, my mother built this home in 1991, which is still, she has since passed away in 2017. So I have pretty much been with her since 91, although I moved away and came back. So I say that to say the owners of the property, everyone who has who is speaking and have participated in these meetings, we have owned our properties since for 15 plus years. So we have a great deal of compassion um, in reference to the upkeep and the, the growth of the community. Um, so my concerns, as, along with my neighbors, and some of them will share them as well as I will, initially, they were about the, the, um, I'm sorry, traffic, the growth of this area. We have greatly outgrown the infrastructure for this area in which we live. So to add Carrington Woods in with, although they express, there are three entrances. One is at Woodland, and the other two that would lead out to Meadowcrest and, and Norwood, they're still, that what they did not share is there is only one road that those streets will lead out to, and that's Clayton Road. Clayton Road is greatly impacted by traffic when Southern High School is in session and when there we are working when, during the rush hours. DOT has not addressed what the growth of this area as far as we can see at this time. There are other communities along with Carrington Woods that have been developed. For instance, Copley Farms. Copley Farms has more than 100 homes, single family homes. And if you add two cars per 100 houses, that greatly exceeds the traffic in which we can handle here. We have had three fatalities as, that I know of 
Um, and we just want something to be addressed in reference to that. Thank you. And also, oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, you, please finish your thought, but, but uh, your, the, okay. your answer. Okay, and the last two concerns that I have is the sa it's safety. Of course, it's safety, and it's the, the infrastructure and the sidewalks. The city, we have met with Ms. Sonyak, city, the planning committee, we, well, city planning. We have met with them. We've done everything that we're supposed to do. So there is a projected date to plant, put in sidewalks along Clayton and Freeman Road. Those dates to start is as August 2020. We don't know if that's still in place. However, there, there are just so many concerns that need to be addressed in reference to the traffic that has not been shared with us. But we've heard some things from Mr. Savila and Glenwood Holmes tonight that we wish were shared prior to today. We are trying to work with them. Um, the last meeting was September 29, 2019. I think there were proper enough time to meet again prior to this pandemic and quarantine so that we could all work together and making sure this take this goes as pleasingly for everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Denise Reeves. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for giving us a chance to um, speak on this proposal. Uh, I'd like to echo everything that Quincy said. Um, I'm also concerned with the traffic. 23 homes would equal greater than 46 cars, which is way too much traffic, even without rush hour. Uh, again, as she spoke, when Southern High School is in session, the traffic is atrocious, and to add those extra cars would be um, impossible. We live at 917 Glen Rose Drive, which is uh, adjacent to Clayton Road. So for us to be able to get out on the Clayton Road at any given time is just an absolute nightmare. It doesn't matter the time of the day. Also, I would like a little more uh, elaboration on the wetlands. It's my understanding that any development near around or through wetlands is going to destroy it, even if it's a very small percentage. So I would like a little elaboration as to what they're going to do. And if they do develop into those wetlands, how it's going to disturb it and or destroy it. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Kenneth Wiggins. And you can, yeah, you, you start. Yeah, you I get it. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, this afternoon and listening to Quincy and I think Denise, uh, pretty much what I had here in the notes that I was writing down, she, they pretty much covered it. And my concerns were, Pretty much the same thing as theirs, um, pretty much the traffic, because like I said, when Southern High School is, is in session, you know, it's, it's pretty rough. You know, I live on Meadowcrest, 14 Meadowcrest Drive, which the development they're going to be doing is behind me. And um, when I come out to Clayton Road, sometimes it's like, you know, playing dodgeball to get out there because it's a tree line that kind of blocks my vision to the left. And I guess kind of take a chance a lot of times. And then when it gets really heavy in traffic, it's kind of rough coming out onto Clayton Road uh, from Meadowcrest. And, and then when school's in, you got kids walking and the kids aren't walking on sidewalks, they're crossing the street, which is to me is a safety a safety problem there because you got all these kids that are getting out at around three o'clock, they're making their way home, and then you got all this traffic and they're, they're crossing the street and there's no sidewalks, a limited amount of sidewalk for them to um, to walk on to get home. So that that's a safety um, concern of mine because there, that Southern High School is in a very deep curve. And uh, unfortunately, a young lady lost her life there a few years back uh, coming around that curve. And I, she was a high school student. So it's, it's a very dangerous curve. I have a cousin that lives in the curve. And every time I go to her house, I gotta make sure I turn all the way around to come out. So just saying it's a pretty safe um, safety issue that we are concerned about when we add traffic to what's already here. And, um, and also, like I said, I've been living here uh, for 20 plus years, um, one of the first houses on Meadowcrest, actually the first house on Meadowcrest. And, and like when I bought the property uh, back, uh, back then, the developer that was, uh, we were buying from, um, he wanted to buy the property that they're now developing on. And he, was, he told me, he said, well, if you choose the lot you're on, you won't have to worry about ever having anybody behind you because there's, a, there's creek and wetlands back there and you can't develop on that. 
and I was like, okay, so I chose the lot that I have, which is 14. So for that reason, and, you know, of course, fast forward, things change, um, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, time changes. But in my mind, I'm like, what has changed? The creek's still there. The wetlands are still there. You know, why is there now a capability to develop uh, in that in that area? Uh, and so pretty much that's the, all the concerns I had, pretty much the safety, uh, traffic, and the wetlands as uh, covered before. So thank you for your time. Thank you. If there's anyone else who'd like to speak who has not yet spoken, uh, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. I see Natalia Russell. Natalia, are you able to speak? see your hand raised and we'll give you one more moment if you're interested in speaking the you you may during the public hearing mr chair is there any way that we can offer these people some suggestions or technical assistance that might be make it easier for them to speak i mean we i'm, we, I'm concerned about having two people who are here and who've indicated a desire to speak but can't yeah I, I mean, we we told them numerous times. Star nine, if you're on by phone, if you're if you're on um, if you're on an, on Zoom, we've got staff who are helping make folks queued up to speak. So if if Natalia Russell, if you are interested in speaking, please uh, please go ahead. I see Penny Sacadlo has her hand up as well, but she's already spoken during the public comment period. And Chris, if you can help me out, there's a there's a 919-308-1389 number who has their hand raised as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry. <laughs> this is Natalia Russell. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I actually stay at 3301 Woodland Park Road, which is on the corner adjacent from um, Ms. Radcliffe uh, and Dairy, uh, Woodland and Dairy. And um, I will say that my concerns mimic those that you've already heard. This is the third time that this um, uh, rezoning has been proposed and the concerns remain pretty much the same. The traffic um, concerns and safety concerns are um, at the forefront. Uh, we really don't feel um, that DOT has properly assessed the area. Um, there's also the impact to wildlife and conservation. We pretty much have uh, wildlife in our front yards now, um, and there's very little trees in this neighborhood because um, it's just overly saturated and populated. Um, and I would implore you to think about the fact that the DOT, um, I can't remember who spoke earlier, where they basically advised that a entrance and exit point was denied onto the main thoroughway of Clayton. And that is because this area is overly populated and saturated all, already. So the additional um, 20, I think it was 23 homes um, would definitely increase the amount of traffic. Um, the safety concerns regarding the high school students, currently there are no sidewalks. They are walking on the side of the street to and from school. And to be quite honest with the COVID, um, you have families now walking around the neighborhoods constantly um, with the, the traffic that we have right now. And it, it, it is very concerning because there's really nowhere for them to walk other than the street. Um, Cheek Road, um, Oh, excuse me, Clayton Road um, continues to be a bottleneck to Cheek Road. If you are commuting anywhere, you are basically stuck. You are at the mercy of the, of the traffic um, that we currently have with the existing neighborhood. And just because there is a patch of land that is between Twin Lakes and Clayton Crossing, it, it doesn't mean we should wedge in 23 or uh, be quite, quite transparent, even 14 homes because that is it, just too saturated. 
I mean, yes, we do understand that there's three exit points, but to Ms. Ratcliffe's point, two of them, there's only one way in and one way out. So what kind of relief are we really getting? So the main entrance would really be Woodland and Dairy. And Woodland is a very busy street as it is. It connects my, most of the main uh, street vessels in Twin Lakes. It's just not a, a, a good idea. I, I, I just, I mean, this is my third time speaking on this issue. My concerns remain the, the same. We are concerned with the safety of the children in this neighborhood and the overly populated saturation of this uh, part of town. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else raising their hand. I'll give it one more moment. And seeing no one else, we will close the public hearing. And commissioners, uh, this is your time. If you want to raise your hands, I'll start with Commissioner Miller, who has his hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to make sure I understand by asking some questions. Um, but I'll begin by saying when this came to us before, uh, having met with the neighbors and understood their concerns, um, and, and my biggest concern was the absence of a development plan. And uh, I can remember that we pleaded with um, the developers to include a development plan um, to get to provide these neighbors with greater level of assurance about what was going to go in here. And, and the answer was it was too expensive to do a development plan for a project so small and that they wouldn't consider it. So I voted against it, uh, at least in part for that reason. Um, but I wanna make sure I remember uh, well from the other case. So I have a question uh, for Ms. Cicaldo and also, or I'm sorry, is it Cicadlo? Cicadlo, and maybe staff can answer this too. Uh, this development plan limits the, the development on this property to 23 single family detached houses. Um, that comes out to about 2.7 units an acre. Um, if that limitation were not present, or if this was just a straight RS10 rezoning, uh, Ms. Cicadlo, you are an engineer. How many uh, single family homes do you think under the RS10 zoning you might put on this property? Uh, given the limitation, certainly you have played with it and figured that out. I believe that um, the, the pure mass says it would be 30, um, but I think that the 23 uh, would be the, the most that would logically go on it. it looks like it may be less, but it is capped at 23. There is um, uh, additional uh, tree save area buffers and the wetlands will all be in open space. So there will be a lot of area preserved. And I'm no engineer or land use planner, but uh, as I look at this property and, and imagine how uh, your internal street system might work, I see the road coming in at Meadow Lane, uh, perhaps uh, turning north to a cul-de-sac or a bulb, and then proceeding kind of in an S shape down to Alpha, and then another uh, road that would run across the wetlands in that area where you say wetlands to be removed in order to access Dairy Road, and that lots would be organized on either side of of these roads and that uh, bulb that would go up towards the north. Is that kind of how you saw it happening? Uh, that is that is kind of how I saw it happening. There is not a lot of flexibility when you are connecting three roadways and trying to limit the crossing of the wetlands to as perpendicular as possible. And the reason you're removing those wetlands is to provide for that crossing. That is correct. Um, Can you, so can you tell me what you anticipate, although it's not shown on the development plan and does not have to be, uh, I'm assuming that there some someplace on this plan, there will be a place for stormwater mitigation. Can you tell me, I'm sure you've thought about that, where that would go and what it would look like? Uh, yes, it will be some sort of um, 
storm measure consisting of a dry pond or sand filter, uh, probably adjacent to the wetlands in the southwest corner, because that is where the property drains. So I'm looking at your development plan sheet three, uh, sheet, well, it's S1 uh, of three. Correct. Uh, and there is uh, uh, a schematic of a tree that says proposed tree coverage area. Is that in that vicinity? Is is that where we're talking about the the stormwater mitigation? Uh, yes, it would either be to the left of that tree or to the um, uh, south of that tree on the other side of the wetlands. So we don't have topo on your development plan, but I'm assuming that. And based upon my recollection, uh, especially when you're over on the east side of the property, uh, the and you're in the backyards of the neighbors there, your property is considerably lower from them, um, and and so the drainage just essentially runs south towards the wetlands. Then, but then when you get to the wetlands, it might rise only gently a little bit on the southern side of the wetlands where Dairy Road connects. Is that correct? Is that, that my is, perception correct? That is correct. Yes, sir. Do you, it, will it be necessary to have some sort of stormwater control measure on the south side, separate from the one on the north side of the wetland property? Um, it, it depends depends on how much area we use for, it depends on which device we use. Mm -hmm. I, I anticipate it's going to be closer to the tree shape, but I need to allow myself some flexibility on the other side of that wetlands because that's all going to be open space anyway. What What's all going to be open space? Oh, the, the area um where you have the buffer on the southern border that's open space and then going north towards that tree shape is open space all the wetlands are open space and going over towards mr wiggins yard is open space because of the wetlands okay and i mean i can see where the wetlands to remain and i know that will be open but uh, and you envision that your site plan will include even more open space beyond those boundaries. <coughs> is that correct? Is that what I understood you to say? That is correct. So those are my questions primarily, excuse me. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Actually, I I was gonna go ahead and just finish my comments. Okay. Um, so, I'm usually the neighborhood guy on the planning commission, and I think I still am. However, this time I look at this property and I consider it how it might be developed in the future. I note that it's entirely surrounded with RS10, uh, with single family homes. RS10 uh, under optimal conditions is three to four units an acre uh, uh, around there. Uh, and this is going to come in at 2.69 units an acre. Uh, we're going to have uh, boundary buffers separating single family homes from single family homes, uh, something that the code does not require. Um, I am very sympathetic to the whole Clayton Road prob problem, uh, especially that curve that happens just as you're going from west east on clayton road that curve around there makes the the sight line tricky um uh and i get all of that my problem is is that ultimately this is a piece of property that is going to be developed and i do not see at any point in the future anybody coming along and proposing a development for this piece of property that has fewer units or a general scheme more consistent with the surrounding development than this one. Uh, I anticipate that some of my colleagues on the Planning Commission may have uh, some pause that this piece of property is to be developed with so few units. Um, uh, 
I think the most important consideration in a situation like this is having a residential infill on a parcel like this that is consistent so that the new people have what the older residents have and that it is all relatively seamless. Um, I would be very concerned if there was only one attachment to the existing neighborhood so that all the cars had to come and go from one place. But here there are three, and are they all going to be used equally? Probably not. Um, probably not. But certainly there will be some division of uses. And I know that if you live in this area and you have to put up with Clayton Road one more trip per day, one more car on that road just seems excruciating. But the simple fact is, is this piece of property and other pieces of property along Clayton Road are going to get developed. Um, my own view and my own advice to the neighborhood, which is unwanted, uh, is that I just don't see a proposal getting better for you than this. And for that reason, I'm inclined to vote for this. However, I can be convinced otherwise if my colleagues on the commission come up with reasons I have not thought of. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks again to the neighbors for, for your comments. Um, you brought up some um, concerns about safety and traffic that I think are warranted. I, I agree with Commissioner Miller that, you know, um, when he was talking about the curve on, on Clayton Road, I mean, when I went out there, it was, I mean, it, it's something that's a, that is qu uh, quite scary. Um, so I, I can see the concern there. Um, I, you know, I was on the fence about this case about two years ago, and I ultimately voted for it because I thought it was a reasonable infill project. Um, you know, it, almost everything around this uh, piece of property is zoned RS10. Uh, some things are probably more, you know, it, it's possible that uh, some of these parcels are more dense than this will end up being. Um, as Commissioner Miller um, was was alluding to and speaking about um, just now, um, you know, one of the things that I think that I like about this project as well, and I appreciate what the developer and the applicant have done, um, is that you know they have added buffers that are not required. They have preserved the wetlands or most of the the wetlands. Uh, it seems like, from what I can tell, the open space. Uh, requirements, they have actually exceeded them, which we don't always see um, from a 15% requirement to 20% is what they are providing. 25% uh, tree coverage, which is a little bit more than sometimes we see. Um, and so I, I do appreciate a lot of those things. Um, again, I feel like it is quite reasonable. And for some of the same reasons that Commissioner Miller pointed to, which is that this is now zoned RS20, which means you know, someone can easily or probably um, develop 15 single family homes that will not be considerably different from 23 single family homes in terms of traffic and impact. So, uh, so for those reasons, I'm also inclined to, to support this. I did have a, just because the question of sidewalks uh, came up, I want to ask staff just to clarify for us and for the neighbors you know, when this, if this is built, um, the developer would be required to build sidewalks along the frontage of their uh, property on Clayton Road. Is it just on the side, on that side of, of, on their side of Clayton Road, or are there other sidewalk requirements? I, I just can't remember when I went out there. Berkeley and Thomas Transportation. Um, so they would be required to build sidewalks just on their side of Clayton Roads so on the south side. Okay. okay. Along the frontage. Yes. Okay, great. And while I have you here, I you know the BPAC did um, recommend uh, traffic calming devices. Uh, I guess your comment to them was that it wasn't a specific enough recommendation. Um, I am curious though because in a recent case you did. Um, you did actually ask the applicant to provide traffic calming devices. I think because they were, it was a little bit more specific, you asked them to provide them, or I think you may have re recommended uh, that they provide them 
uh, on roads that connect to other neighborhoods, right? Uh, so the applicant was um, proffering traffic calming devices that were more specific um, right. with a specific type of measure, um, which we could then enforce at the site plan stage. In this case, just saying you right. would provide them, it could just be a stop sign, which is not really right. getting to the point of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. But if, if the applicant was to say, well, we could provide traffic calming devices along or right at Deria Road, for example, for example, um, that would be something enforceable and, and in your mind, something uh, desirable? Along with a specific type of measure. Because every measure is not appropriate in every location. Okay. So we would want to evaluate that as well. Okay. And, and you wouldn't be able to do, to do that tonight, so we couldn't. If we, if I asked the applicant for something like that, it, it wouldn't be specific enough for where, for you to be able to say we're comfortable with that commitment. Is that correct? Right. I would want to look at the specific layout of the area just to see if to make sure it was appropriate in that setting. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I guess for the applicant, I mean, I I, I do have a uh, just to follow up on that. I do think that some of the concerns that have been raised. Um, are about traffic and about safety and about um, and I and I do wonder if some traffic calming devices along some of the, the the three access points would would really go a long way and I know you can do that at site plan but I think you know it might it is a it's always a I think a, a good gesture to the neighbors to to do something like that at this stage in the in the process and I'm curious if you would be I, I guess I'm not going to ask you to do that tonight, but if, if you could try to do that or work with staff to do that before the the vote uh, at city council, would you be willing to do that? Or have you considered that? Uh, yes, this is Penny again. Mm -hmm. um, it is obvious that we have thought about it. We offered it. Um, one of the dilemmas we have is as your traffic engineer has, has stated, you have to pick something that's appropriate for a particular situation. And in two of these connections, we're one house away from an intersection. So you have to be, there's already gonna be a stop sign there. Um, so we were thinking the traffic common would be better suited in the middle of the project to right. slow things down in the middle of the project because each end has an intersection within one width of a house. Um, and, and so that's the dilemma we got into. But the, the short answer is yes, we have thought about it. Uh, yes, we are willing to talk about it. Uh, I don't know if we can get as specific as we can without having our subdivision plan completely visible to everybody that needs to approve it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess I will wrap up and say that I I think for some of the same reasons as Commissioner Miller, I'm I'm inclined to to, to vote in favor of this. Um, I think it's a reasonable request. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alturk. Uh, Commissioner Baker. I have a lot of similar things to say. Um, I had some of the same questions, so I won't ask those. Um, this area really really does lack um, sidewalks and um, that's that's frustrating um, and that's because of the past and the current priorities of the North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, and it's also because in the past developers were not required to build sidewalks. Um, uh, that is in part because of the persistence of this body that developers are now required to build sidewalks on both sides of the street. Um, and so, you know, the automobile traffic, um, I also think has incrementally become worse because uh, we are designing virtually all communities to only realistically be accessible by automobile. Um, we really uh, very rarely see any other realistic option. Uh, so I think that the lack of sidewalks um, in this particular case, in this particular area, really shows a very clear environmental and mobility justice issue. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to know that uh, upon development of this site, there will be a sidewalk along at least their portion of, of Clayton Road. So that's positive. 
Um, you know, similar to the things that uh, Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Alturk said, you know, this is a, an infill development. Um, it's within walking distance, again, you know, recognizing that there's a lack of the proper pedestrian infrastructure, uh, but this is within walking distance of, of a school. Um, and the fact of the matter is that um, we are a recommending body. The Planning Commission is a recommending body and our recommendation uh, will move forward to the Durham City Council. And Durham City Council has shown a, a very strong preference for high density, for higher densities, even higher um, than, than is being proposed in this proposal. Uh, and so I think that the residents um, sh should have a say over what happens in their communities and, and frustrated by the things that, that we've heard today. Um, but I also believe that there is a fair balance uh, between increasing density in a neighborhood near a high school and also not causing you know, additional heartburn and, and pain to the surrounding community. Um, so while I'm not necessarily enthusiastic about the proposal before us, I do think that, there, that it may sort of represent and embody a, a fair balance. Um, or as, as fair as, as we can expect to, to, to be achieved. So um, I would just second uh, to the applicant that, you know, I would ask uh, that you work with Erlene and work with staff and, and try to incorporate traffic calming. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, I would like to see traffic calming commitments um, if possible, you know, by the time this, this goes to council. And I, I will be putting that um, in my uh, submitted comments to council. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Kempson? Uh, yeah, first I wanna say, I really do appreciate the, um, the second time around. I mean, I, this came before us, I remember it well, and I think it's much improved from when it was presented uh, a couple of years ago. I, I voted no for it. Uh, I'm gonna vote no for it again. Um, to me, uh, I mean, Clayton Road is a real problem. Um, and not just that, but compounded by the fact that it's the high school that so many students walk to all the time. And it is a real problem. I just can't um, imagine a scenario where I would vote yes um, for something that might jeopardize student safety. Um, and next year, in fact, I think, from what I've heard, not been verified yet, but I think the uh, middle school and elementary schools will be using Southern as opposed to high school students. They'll be online. Not been confirmed yet. But whether it's high schoolers or middle schoolers, it is a very dangerous uh, road. Um, and I think it's a very good development plan. It's much improved. I really do appreciate the effort that's been into it. Uh, but until Clayton Road is fixed, uh, we approved one similar to this on Freeman Road, but it was because they made some improvements to Freeman Road. Um, they've got to fix that road. It's, it's just not, I can't imagine putting students in that position. Um, I'll be voting no. Uh, until Clayton Road is fixed. Um, and I would urge my commissioners to think about student safety. Um, and, and let's put that above some other uh, things as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kenshin. Commissioner Johnson. I'm sorry, uh, we'll, we'll start with Commissioner Williams. I'm sorry, I got, got you out of order. Then Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Busby. Um, I actually echo a lot of what Commissioner Kenshin said. Um, Clayton Road is an extremely highly traveled area. So is uh, Freeman Road, even with the improvements, um, you have a lot of blindsided. And even with the high schools returning for the fall, um, mainly online, you've got middle schools and elementary schools using the high school to see even more dangerous situation. Um, there's an ongoing issue with Clayton Road that I don't see getting improved anytime soon unless something major is done or there's enough of a community impact in which these upgrades are being made. I also have an issue with developing in this area for numerous reasons outside of the day-to-day -day traffic with high schools getting out at four o'clock. You've got people traveling back in from Raleigh off Highway 98 that live in that part of Durham and they cut over and they, this is a heavily traveled area, <clears throat> excuse me, not to mention Southern football program, generating a lot of traffic on the street parking in that area. 
so this basketball program is generating a lot of traffic with people in that area parking on the street. Um, some traffic measures would be helpful, but I don't see where many could do a lot, even if even if there were traffic lights, there's going to be other issues because you're going to force cut throughs of neighborhoods and other areas to try to avoid certain traffic measures that are maybe put in place. None of this is at the control of the developer. This is just unforeseen circumstances that are a hazard in this area. The lack of sidewalks in this area is major. I've driven in this area several times and the number of students that commute from school to home have no other choice or path but to walk in the street or to try to walk on not even what is a bike lane. It's literally just the yellow stripe on the side of the road and then dirt. And any slight mistake, even from a young driver, and there's an automatic loss of life. So it's, it's detrimental and it's something that we need to address. And though voting yes for this will not stop someone else from developing in this area, perhaps the the commentary in which we have on public rec record, if reviewed, will be enough to shake someone to say, hey, let's make some improvements, let's do a little bit better, let's have a, a little bit more consideration for this area, let's put in sidewalks, let's handle the traffic issues. Even if the Department of Transportation has no immediate plans for remediation for this, this particular area, a developer can come in and commit to building sidewalks and easing that foot traffic and doing a little bit more. And I absolutely applaud this developer for coming in, making the adjustments. I remember this case very well. I love the way that it's approached. I love the considerations that are put in, but it still doesn't change the fact that this is a heavily saturated area with a lot of traffic and no real way to control that traffic either on foot or by vehicle not to mention public transportation is not really a major force in this area that could help some, like lessen some of the driver traffic if it was more efficient to this area. So those are my comments and I do plan to vote no. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, can you hear me? So uh, I echo uh, the sentiments of Commissioner Williams and, and uh, Commissioner Kitchen. And um, one, I, I would like to state that I think that the, the second go round of what we're looking at now is uh, very much improvement for, for what I, I voted against uh, with the last vote. But I too remember this case because I spent time driving that area and that site multiple times at different times of the day. And the, the safety issue with that area of that project site still like is the key factor that's driving like the quality of life, reality of whatever comes to that place, uh, to, to this site in this area. And again, as Commissioner Williams stated, you know, this is not necessarily uh, the fault or, you know, the owner of the developer. This is just the context in which the developer is trying to uh, to develop this site. And I just, I'm not comfortable, and I guess uh, I'm prepared to vote no tonight, even if this vote, uh, the final vote is in favor. I want the, um, the, the, the city leadership to understand that this is not a clear-cut vote that, you know, it's, it's an improvement for what we started with. And so it, it's, it's you know, green pastures ahead because I think there are some challenges in that area that have to be addressed because we're literally, literally talking about human lives. When I first drove that site and saw how close it was to the school, my first thing was there's no way if I was a parent, I'd be com comfortable allowing my child to walk around that bend to get to the school. So it's like something has to be done because this won't be the last project that comes to this area. And, you know, this is the reality. I, this is a tough vote for me because, you know, I understand that development will happen. More cars will be uh, placed on the road as a result. But at this point in time, I think that, um, you know, my vote will hopefully uh, send some kind of signal to the final orbiters of uh, what happens with this project that, you know, further consideration beyond
beyond this particular development is something that has to be thought through because the city continues to grow. We're going to be, I think, com confronted with similar situations in regards to infrastructure and the impact on human lives and the quality of life in these communities. So I just wanted to make sure I was on record for that. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Durkin? Yes, I have a question for Arlene. You can come back online. Yes. Hi. Um, so if this, if this, if we don't approve the, if this development does not occur and they're not accordance with this development plan that's in front of us and the, the applicant could develop just based on existing zoning and it would be eight fewer homes, but could they have an, an egress, a street onto Clayton directly? Um, at this point, I do not believe DOT was willing to grant a new access point to Clayton Road just because of the proximity to the other intersections and the site distance issue that's okay. been mentioned with the curve, but ultimately it would be NCDOT's decision. Okay, yeah, I don't remember on the last time we saw this whether or not there had been um, a street and entrance onto Clayton. Right, there, there was not. Okay, okay, that's okay. Okay. I'm inclined to vote yes for this one. Um, it's it's not ideal. I I do think this property will get developed, and I appreciate the fact that there's a development plan and a lot has been done since the last time we saw this one. Uh, significant time and effort has gone into this, and this gives us a development plan that has a lot more commitments than we saw before, which was really nothing. So I'm inclined to vote. Yes, it is not ideal. I do think that Clayton Road needs a lot of work, um, but I don't think that this development is going to be the one that fixes it if we vote no for it. Thank you, Commissioner Durkin. Uh, Commissioner Miller, I'm going to hold off one sec and seeing if there are any commissioners who haven't spoken yet who would like to speak. Okay, I don't see anyone else. So back to you, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I see that I might be voting against Mr. Kinchin and Ms. Williams, then I have to rethink my position. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm going to vote with them, but I want to explore a little bit uh, and explain my position some. I've been in the neighborhood advocacy business for a very, very long time. And I have seen cases where neighborhoods have to come down to City Hall over and over and over again on the same piece of property. And eventually there's a there's a calculus at work where you, you have to pull the trigger and, and take your best shot for fear that the next one may be much worse. And that's kind of where I am with this, but I don't live in the neighborhood and I don't speak for these people. I just, I, I have that feeling uh, with, the, with the way we're going with density taking such an important part of our uh, policy thinking and what have you. I have had just this feeling that, that the likelihood that we're going to get a better proposal for this in terms of compatibility is increasingly small. But I do get the issue. I mean, I drove out there and to make a left hand turn um, uh, uh, out of this neighborhood onto Clayton Road with that curve is scary. And I can imagine doing it every single day to commute, commute into the city of Durham. I, I would worry me. I would probably, I have not tried all three. I've done two of the three entrances into this area. And I'm sure that it might function. I might have one way out in the morning and another way in in the afternoon. I don't know. Um, but here's, here's what I'm going to ask my colleagues uh, who are inclined to vote no to think about. Under the current RS-20 zoning, uh, I think it would be very easy to develop 15, maybe even 16 single family homes. The difference there between 16 and 23 is pretty small. Uh, and that, that isn't going to come before. It's not going to come before anybody. The neighborhood's never going to be invited to see it. That's going to go straight to site plan review and then to building permits. Uh, no public comment, no chance to resist, no chance for input. Um, and we are literally talking about a difference of, you know, 23 versus 15. 
So the, here's my question to, to you folks who are inclined to vote no. If this project was 20 units instead of 23 units, and I know that the developer is not asking that, but I'm asking it, would that change your thinking? Because the traffic impact, the, the incremental traffic impact uh, caused by this development ultimately onto Clayton Road is a function of the number of units. Um, and we know that right now the number of units, uh, the traffic impact of 16 is there. It's on the books. Uh, that could happen. Um, I don't think it will because I don't think a developer is actually going to develop it that way. I think they're going to, the next request is going to be for, for, you know, 50 townhouses. Um, but if it were 20 units instead of 23 units, would that change your thinking? And that's my question. Uh, and I wanted to put it in the context of my overall fear for the way this is going. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. I see Commissioner Williams has raised her hand. I recognize you. Thank you, Chair Busby. And no, even at 20 units, a three unit difference would not change my, my voting. 12 or a half of that, yeah, maybe, but not at 20. And at the end of the day, knowing what I know about the situation, and I know that someone can and someone might, come through and they may develop in that area, but I have to look at what's in front of me right now and what's in front of me right now is a proposal for 23 units. And at the end of the day, in good conscience, I have to live with myself and I'm not okay with it. No, no one else has to come before me and no public hearings and they can have the right of way to build whatever they like once they get the zoning permits and everything is approved or the building permits, um, excuse me but I still have to live with myself and driving through that area with 50 townhomes, I won't be just as concerned. It's gonna be just as much as an issue. I just won't have a say, but today I have a say, so I'm using it. Great. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Kenshin. I would, I would agree with uh, Commissioner Williams. It wouldn't change my vote either. Um, I mean, the neighbors have spoken um, and they don't want it and they feel it's unsafe. I agree. I think it's very unsafe. I think um, no, no one can, can convince me that it's, that it's a safe place for students or young people to be walking down the street. Um, and let me add one more thing. I've got to say this. If this was if this was Jordan High School, I don't think this would be um, I don't think we would even consider it. Uh, I've been on the commission for a while. I've lived in Durham for 22 years. I don't think we would have this kind of pause if it was uh, Jordan High School, but it's not. It's Southern High School. Got to say it. I'm sorry for saying it, but um, we're talking about the safety of students. I, it is, it's a real issue for me, and uh, this, the community have said they don't want it. I agree with them. I concur, and I know someone can come and do the same thing, but not because I voted for it. They may, they may come out and do 20 units or whatever, but not because I voted for it. So I can't stop that, but I can say no to this one. I don't think it's safe. I think it wouldn't be right to go against community wishes. Um, and our precedent has been uh, opposite of what that would be. So I would say no. So, Thank Mr. Busby, those were my questions, and I really appreciate the heartfelt responses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lowe and then uh, Commissioner Landfried. Uh, thank you, Chair Busby. Uh, evident. Well, obviously, I wasn't part of this uh, planning board meeting when this first came through, but uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the backdrop information that has been presented here tonight. <clears throat> and to me, the major issue for me is the issue of safety. Um, from what I'm hearing tonight, that it is a public safety should be foremost in our minds. And as has been forestated, uh, some of the residents in that area have voiced their opposition against this. So uh, I'm inclined tonight to vote no to this matter. Thank you, Commissioner Love. Commissioner Lantry? Um, yeah, I have a question again um, for Ms. Thomas um, on the sidewalks issue. Yes. <laughs> um, 
what I think one of the members of the public mentioned that they had had some meetings with the city about sidewalks and that they had the impression that there was a plan to build sidewalks on um, Clayton Road. Um, can you uh, update us on that? That might help us give a sense of whether there are other processes in place that might address some of these safety concerns, hopefully um, sooner rather than later. So the city does have a current um, sidewalk project that will build sidewalks on Clayton and Freeman Road, but they are near the high school. So there will still remain some gaps between this development um, and the sidewalk that's proposed to be constructed near the high school. And that sidewalk is planned for um, construction in, this, in August of this year. That's helpful, thank you. And I don't know if it'll be helpful. The limits of the con um, sidewalk construction for the city's project is from Freeman Road down to Chandler Road, along Clayton Road. It'll be from Freeman to Chandler. And then on Freeman Road, it will be from Clayton to Obsidian Way. That's great to hear. Um, given everything we've heard. So thank you for that update. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions, Commissioner Landfried? No, that's all. Appreciate it. Great. I actually had a follow up for Ms. Thomas. So we, I'm sorry to make you jump back in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No problem. So uh, the, the last questions my Commissioner Landfried were really important in my opinion. And um, so when the sidewalk gets built and I'm trying to, you gave us everything and I'm trying to look at Google Maps to make sure I have it all correct. So this development is on the other side of the street. Uh, you know, what's really interesting about this development and one of the things that excited me about it originally is that if you walked through Meadow Lane, which will now connect, you would come up briefly up Meadowcrest Drive to Clayton Road. If I were a student living in this neighborhood, I am less than a half a mile from Southern High School. If, I, if I'm living in the neighborhood, going to the high school, uh, in theory, that should be an easy pedestrian opportunity. In current practice, it is incredibly scary, as my fellow commissioners have pointed out. Uh, is there the opportunity, when these improvements are made, is there also going to be some sort of crosswalk or, or a hawk signal or something that will allow students to get from the west side of Clayton across the street to the actual high school? Is that in the current improvement plan? I would need to look at the sidewalk plan, but more than likely those types of improvements, uh, they are typically included um, when they are, they are near schools. But I would need to confirm that by looking at the um, plans themselves. Okay. And, and do you mind repeating then, coming out of Southern High School, going north on Clayton Road, how, how far will this current sidewalk improvements go? Where, where does it end? So the, the project coming out of, sorry, where was your start point again? If you're, I'm basically thinking if you're coming out of Southern High School and mm -hmm. you're headed north on Clayton Road. Okay. Where, does this, where will the new sidewalk end? So the city's project it, it does not, is not along that section of Clayton Road. Okay. So it, it, it starts at, um, for Clayton Road, it starts at Freeman and goes south to Chandler Road. And then along Freeman Road, it starts at Clayton and goes east to Obsidian Way where there's um, existing sidewalk that's being constructed um, by nearby development. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, before I recognize Commissioner Al Turk, I mean, I'll just tell you where I stand, fellow commissioners. This has been really tough and still is. I wrote down a whole bunch of questions when I read this packet, and most every single one got checked off except sidewalks to the school. And um, I'm I'm not comfortable voting on this one. I'm gonna vote no, but you could blow me over with a feather because I understand this is not under the control of these proponents, but I'm gonna stand with my fellow commissioners to hopefully send a message to our elected officials that 
uh, we got to do better. We got to do better around Southern High School, and we got to make these investments to make it safe for the students. Uh, Commissioner Kenshin's point is well taken. Uh, you know, Jordan High School, lots of sidewalks, so we, we got to do better. So, uh, but that said, I, I understand every commissioner's thinking who are going to plan to vote for it because I recognize all those points as well, and I have no idea what the what the right the right decision is. So, uh, but I'm a no vote. Commissioner Alter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think if Miss uh, Ratcliffe is still on the line, and I think she is, I you know from her comments, you know, I, I got a sense of. And, and maybe I was, I'm wrong, but that she was appreciative of the changes that have been made or the clarity that has been provided. Um, and she would have just liked more time to think about it and to, uh, to have had some more conversations with the developers. And I'm, I'm curious just if, if she wouldn't mind answering, you know, based on our conversation tonight as well, um, in particular, this point about, you know, if we don't, if this is not rezoned, you know, there will still likely be 15 to 16 single family homes, there would be increased traffic. It's, it's possible that there would be fewer or less uh, environmental protections. Um, you know, we can't control some of those things. If, um, you know, if, if uh, it goes straight to site plan, it goes straight to the administrative um, body, the planning, uh, planning uh, department. So I'm curious from Ms. Ratcliffe, if she would, you know, what, what would she like to see from this development plan or from this, uh, or what she sees tonight would, you know, maybe make her more comfortable supporting this? Because I, I got the sense that maybe she was on the fence. And so uh, if, you know, if she wouldn't mind answering that, that would be helpful to me. Ms. Ratcliffe, if you are uh, still available to speak, you are welcome to answer Commissioner Alturk's question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not on the fence. As from all the meetings we've had, um, I'm willing to work with them, just like my neighbors are willing to work with them. But all our concerns are, as long as our concerns are heard and met, um, because we are, we live here. We know what happened. We know the, the traffic zones, the issues that goes on in this, this, this area. Everyone that's speaking, they come and go, but we're here every day. So my concern is we would, we would greatly work with them if they will try to accommodate what our requests are. Um, that one meeting they had with us at the library in September, they never followed up. Um, as Ms. Sonyak and Ms. Thomas suggested to us when we met with them, it would be best for us to work as together. And that's what we have tried to do with them. Um, so if, the, if they could clearly sit down and talk to us and give us the development plan and let us see what they have instead of waiting to present something to you all that they have one. They didn't show that to us. As I'm looking at my notes now, from what Penny explained, Miss Penny explained, it seems like it's still the same plan that she they share with us in September. Um, so I'm not going to say I'm necessarily on the fence. It, all my concerns are with the traffic and the safety of the children and the pedestrians who have to ride public transportation, our neighbors who walk and exercise. Um, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. But I under, we know that this development, this land is going to be developed eventually. We do understand that. However, if somebody is willing to work with us and hear our demands and our concerns, we will work with them as well. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Ratcliffe, and thanks for clarifying your position and, and um, correcting me on that. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I was in favor or I'm inclined to, in, to vote for this. I, 
Um, I will likely vote no on this now, but I will ask the applicant if they will. I mean, I don't know what else can be done. I, do, I mean, I do think uh, I am still on the fence about this because I do think this is a decent pr pr proposal. And I think even the, the commissioners who are voting against this have acknowledged that this is a, you know, a, a pretty good or not bad proposal. And so I, I don't know if it can be improved, but um, I'll just ask the applicant if they would consider a continuance to, to, to meet with the neighbors and maybe either present the development plan a little bit more, give them more time to, to think about it and to, you know, to work with them, uh, you know, maybe get that number down a little bit, you know, down from 23 to something else that is, is a little bit more reasonable you know, or, or suitable for the, the neighborhood. Um, so I, I will just ask the applicant if they, if they would like a continuance because I, I think I will be voting no. Uh, Mr. Sevilla or Ms. Sicadlo, you're welcome to answer Commissioner Alturk's question. Uh, this is Penny Sicadlo. And the answer is um, certainly we're always open to suggestions. I don't know that this developer is capable of solving Clayton Road's traffic issue. Um, we did hear uh, from Miss Ratcliffe uh, about wanting some more buffer behind her yard. That is on the development plan. We heard from Mr. Wiggins that he wanted some more um, space behind his lot. That's open space. We have addressed their conditions, um, but I'm still open to finding out if there's something else short of redesigning Clayton Road. Commissioner Alturk, any additional questions or comments? No, I, I don't think I will ask for the continuance unless other commissioners feel like it is warranted. Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree, I think, with that general that comment that I've heard a number of times already tonight, which is that we probably we can't solve the problem on Clayton Road, and so. Um, but I don't know if other commissioners have other, you know, if, if they think a continuance would be helpful, I I will entertain that option, but I, I won't ask for it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Amandolia. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to briefly say I came in tonight expecting to vote yes for this it seems to me an opportunity for info development and affordable units the applicant cited 250k homes which to me seems like a step forward for ability especially in this area however the words of commissioners williams and kinchin have uh, moved me to reconsider that i agree we cannot um, change the current patterns on clayton road with this vote, but I think it is important for us to stand together and tell this and show the city that um, we need to do better in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pivot back to both Commissioner Baker and then Commissioner Miller. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, you know, our, our votes are not the final say. Their recommendations to city council and sometimes that means that we need to send a message um, and this isn't about uh, punishing or rewarding developers this is about making a logical judgment and a statement about planning issues the planning issues that come before us um, second i think that um, the density is appropriate um, but i think maybe the timing is not appropriate and that is one thing that i that i heard uh, several uh, commissioners say, um, and that's planning. That's logical planning. Um, third, um, you know, I think our comments to council are as important and sometimes more important than our actual vote, the, the vote that we take and the vote count. And I think that whenever council comes uh, and takes a look at the, at the uh, comments that we have provided and when uh, commissioners are uh, Unanimous or near unanimous, near unanimous, or saying the consistent, you know, saying the same things con consistently, you know, council takes note of that. And I think that, uh, you know, if we all have similar things to say on this application, that um, that that will 
uh, that will resonate with them. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, I often uh, approach a case with a strong opinion, and I often approach a case wanting to persuade my fellow commissioners uh, of my opinion, and I want them to listen to what I'm saying, and I want them to vote with me. And um, and I have been persuaded, uh, so uh, I will I will be voting no. Um, you know, this isn't about punishing a, a developer or rewarding a developer. This is about uh, sending a message to council, and I intend to um, put uh, a lot of this discussion in, in my comments to council. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. So thank you very much, and I wanted to say the same thing. I've had my hand up for a while. Um, all throughout this case, this time and last time, I've had my neighborhood advocates hat on. Uh, this time when I saw this plan, I thought, well, finally, we got the thing that we wanted last time. Uh, but I forgot why we wanted it. Uh, we wanted it because this is where these neighbors live. It's whose town is it? It's their town. Um, I've turned in and out of this neighborhood a couple of times in the last two years. They do it a couple of times every day. Uh, nobody knows this area better than they do. Uh, and so when we depart from what they see as problems or what their vision for the area is, I think we are on shaky ground. And I'm grateful to my fellow commission members for reminding me of that. So I'm going to vote. Um, no, if I must on this. Um, I don't think it's fair uh, to take a piece of property that's going to be developed somehow by somebody uh, and say that whoever has this is, is uh, responsible for fixing Clayton Road. Uh, but I do think we have to take into account, no matter who proposes what, that Clayton Road is the way it is. Uh, and we can send a message to the city, but ultimately the city doesn't have a hell of a lot of control over Clayton Road. It's an NCDOT uh, facility. I would love to have, and I also realize having a lot, done a lot of this work myself, that there are a lot of factors uh, that go into this and that a solution where developers and neighbors come together uh, is never perfect for either side. I saw where Mr. Al Turk was going with the possibility of giving them 60 days to really work it out and to put things on the table uh, and to make adjustments that might be incrementally enough uh, so that the neighbors balancing their risks uh, and the impacts and the developers, their pocket, their interest in their pocketbook can perhaps come together. And so I like the idea of a 60 day continuance if the parties want it and we work together in good faith to see if there's middle ground. Um, I, I just can't ever get it out of my head that you can build 16 houses on this piece of property right now. Uh, and while it's like with my approval, without my approval, the fact is, is with or without it, they can do it. Um, and we're no closer to, to making things better there uh, uh, than uh, we are if we approve or disapprove of this project. So I'm going to make a motion, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that we continue this based upon what I've heard the neighbors uh, through Ms. Ratcliffe and the developers through uh, Ms. Cadlow say a motion to continue this for 60 days to see if these parties can work it out. Uh, I will say this, uh, that if this motion is voted down, I'm going to vote against this project, and that may influence how the rest of you vote. So that's my motion, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? The motion is for second. a two-cycle, 60-day continuing. Second. Second, OK. So moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Al-Turk. And again, this is a 
two cycle delay. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Smith, what's the proper term we should be using? Because we usually say two cycles and we're meeting every other week, it seems like. Two, two cycles is okay because that's our regular cycle, but the date is September 15th. Okay. And, and that's my motion, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Okay, um, this is the motion to continue. Commissioner Williams? Commissioner uh, Williams? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Uh, before I vote, I, the question, it, can we do this with, without having to get approval or this uh, from the, uh, the applicant themselves? Can we, can this be- You by? can continue it without their consent. Um, that's up to the commission. I know a lot of times you do ask, but I think that they did ask earlier and they indicated they'd be willing to work with the okay. um, members. If, unless assuming, okay. uh, assuming that's the, the, the context, yes. Okay. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Amon, Amandelia? Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Lanfried? Yes. Commissioner Keenshin? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Okay. Commissioner McIver? Yes. Okay, it passes 13-0 unanimous to be continued to September 15th. We'll put it on the agenda. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who spoke on that item. We look forward to hearing about the progress on September 15th. Uh, we're moving to our final zoning map change item this evening. This is the Cortez Drive residential proposal and it's case Z19-0038. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening, uh, Jamie Sonyak again with the Durham Planning Department. <clears throat> I uh, we I will be presenting the uh, Cortez Drive residential zoning map change application. Next slide, please. The applicant is Bethesda Associates, LLC. The property is located along Andrew Avenue and Cortez Drive. Um, it is roughly 46 acres in size, located in the suburban, uh, suburban tier. The applicant is proposing to change the zoning to plan development residential 5.322. Uh, there is no change to the future land use designation, which is low, medium uh, density residential. And um, the development plan indicates uh, a development with up to 250 residential units. Next slide. On the aerial, the site is highlighted in red. It is um, uh, generally undeveloped, heavily wooded. There are wetlands and streams. It has frontage on Andrew Avenue and is separated by uh, Cortez Drive. Next slide, please. The um, uh, this slide provides area, uh, area pictures as well as um, the site and the surroundings. The property is situated among a number of existing residential homes, including along Cortez Drive and Andrew Avenue. To the south um, and north are additional single family homes, including a rezoning request, which was approved on June 10th, 2020, along Pleasant Drive and South Miami Boulevard for up to 170 apartment units. Uh, to the rear is undeveloped land and a commercial center which um, fronts on South Miami Boulevard. Next slide, please. This provides the context of the existing zoning on the left um, and the proposed zoning on the right. The property is also located within the Falls Jordan Lake Watershed Protection Overlay. Um, as noted on the, on the right, the property is proposed for a PDR 5.322. Next slide, please. This um, slide shows the 
future land use designation of the property being in the low medium density residential which is four to eight dwelling units per acre which is consistent with this request next slide um, as included in the staff report uh, this is the development plan which highlights the access points the building and parking envelope riparian buffers 10 foot no build areas uh, tree coverage areas um, it also identifies the number of units and the density. Next slide, please. In terms of the um, key text commitments, the development plan commits to single family detached and residential townhouse units as the um, permitted building type. It restricts the number of units to 250 units. There are a series of transportation um, related improvements associated with the TIA, the transportation impact analysis. Um, there's a commitment to construction of sidewalk in uh, several of the gap areas. Um, there's also a commitment to provide additional asphalt along the front, front full frontage of the site along um, uh, the east side of Andrew Avenue for a bicycle lane. Next slide. Uh, this highlights some of the um, graphic uh, and design commitments included on the development plan. Next slide. Um, subsequent to the writing of the staff report, the applicant has offered a number of additional um, design commitments that have been reviewed and approved by staff that I would like to read uh, into the record and I'll, I'll read them slowly because it's, um, uh, I believe it's two slides here. So in terms of the architectural style, residential buildings within the proposed community. Um, the development will have compatible architectural elevations with respect to materials, color, and overall development elements. In terms of the distinct architectural features, the townhome building front elevations shall have a minimum offset of 16 inches with two offsets per every building of four units to enhance architectural variation. A minimum of three colors shall be utilized per residential building. Decorative garage doors shall be used with the development within the development and shall include garage uh, carriage house style hardware um, or windows. Residential buildings shall have a combination of pit, cable, or shed roofs. In terms of the building materials, residential building materials shall exclude vinyl siding. Residential building roofs shall have composite shingles or metal roof roofing. Additionally, uh, in terms of the residential housing type si and sizes, the development shall include a variety of town home units and single family dwelling sizes to reach a border market of family sizes, home transition and home affor and housing affordability. No less than 20%, but no more than 45% of the townhouse units shall exceed 1,400 square feet. No less than 10%, uh, but no more than 25% of the single family units shall exceed 1,700 square feet. No site plan for the new development on the subject property shall be approved without provision for at least 100 townhouse townhome lots and at least uh, 30 single family detached lots. The development shall include townhomes with a maximum width of 18 feet. Single family dwelling shall feature a maximum width of 30 feet. Next slide, please. In terms of the um, comp plan policies, the proposed zoning is consistent with the future land use designation of low, medium density residential, which would be consistent with the rezoning request and the proposed um, application is consistent with the comprehensive plan policies, including those listed on the screen and provided uh, in further detail, detail of the staff report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. So we will open the public hearing. We have eight individuals who signed up as proponents. Uh, and I, I may ask Mr. George and Mr. Ghosh if, if all eight are
planning to speak or if they're doing it as a package. And, um, and then we have one individual signed up in opposition. Uh, Hi, uh, this is Neil Ghosh and um, I will say uh, Mr. Steve George, Laura Holman, Ryan Akers from McAdams and Rhino Stevenson from Rainy Kemp are all part of the team here and they're all available to answer questions, but I, I was planning on doing the speaking. I'm not, sounds like there are some other folks who've signed up uh, in support of this and I'm not aware of who they are. Uh, I, I may repeat some of the names. That's really helpful. Laura Holloman, Audra Slavin, who I think spoke on a previous item, and Tammy Hayes. Yeah, so Laura Holloman is, is uh, with McAdams and she's on the team. Okay. Well, I, I'll propose, why don't, why don't you go ahead, Mr. Ghosh, and, and if, if you want to speak as the proponent on behalf of the team, and I'll read off any of the additional names. I think some of these folks signed up maybe for multiple hearings. I'm not sure they're still on the call. Oh, I see. I understand. All right. Well, um, Ms. Smith? Hold on um, one I, do, I do believe there was a person signed up for the very first hearing that had put the wrong case number by their name. So that person may have left the meeting. I'm looking now. I don't see them in attendance still. Okay. Um, so that might be the, the where the math is a little weird. So you'll find out, I guess, when you get to them. Thank you. Sure. So should I begin? Please. Yeah. So uh, good evening or rather good night, I guess. Uh, Chair Busby and members of the Planning Commission, my name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group here in Durham at 112 West Main Street. Uh, I'm representing the applicant for this project. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Steve George is with us on behalf of the applicant. So is Laura Holman and Ryan Akers from McAdams and Rhino Stevenson from Rainy Camp. Let me start first by thanking Jamie, not only for her presentation just now, but also for her guidance and diligent review of the additional proffers which you just presented for this development. Thank you very much for your, for your work on that and working with us on that, Jamie. Um, and I'll start by saying that this is a development that I am personally excited to be able to work on because I think it is a step in the right direction for new residential communities in Durham. As you can see from the commitments, the developer is proposing a community with a mix of housing types including at least two different townhome options and two different single family options. In reality, we believe there will be more than just two options for each type of home, but the proffers ensure at least two options for each type. Uh, there are various other commitments which speak to the quality of the building materials, variations in the front facades of townhome buildings, the width of the actual homes, and the minimum mix of housing type. I, I hate to gloss over these, but you know, I, it's getting late and I know we have limited time, but, you know, suffice it to say that these commitments speak to the thought and intentionality that the applicant has put into this community. Now, aside from those text commitments, there are other commitments which are worth mentioning. First of all, a traffic study was required for this development, and there are several committed road improvements included on the D plan as a result of that study. In addition to the improvements that would be required to access the property, it is worth noting that the developer of this community would be required to build out the remainder and improve the existing portions of Cortez Drive to city standard, which is more than a third of a mile of road construction. There also is a small gap in the sidewalk along Cortez, which, the, which is offsite, which the applicant has committed to completing, in addition to the sidewalk on the remainder of Cortez. Uh, the development plan also commits to installing traffic signals subject to NCDOT approval, of course, but uh, those traffic signals will be at the intersections of Angier and Pleasant and Angier and Glover. All told, the development plan commits to a significant level of new infrastructure. But wait, there's more. Uh, as you can see on the D plan, there is a wetland feature or stream feature on the property, which essentially cuts the assemblage into three distinct areas. Of course, this presents challenges to how the property can be developed, but it is worth noting that the developer, in this case, has committed to only one stream crossing. And I wanted to point that out because that commitment is quite subtle. It is a graphic commitment, but the UDO requires D plans to show all proposed stream crossings 
As you can see, only one is shown on this D plan because the developer has taken the time to consider carefully this community's impact on the environment. Likewise, in addition to saving the vegetation within the wetland area, the D plan graphically commits to saving over two acres of existing vegetation in the northeast corner of the property. While that land is developable, rather than trying to shoehorn in as many homes as possible, the developer has set that area aside intentionally to provide a meaningful buffer area for existing homes along Shiloh. Overall, the development plan commits to preserving around 9.4 acres of existing tree coverage and vegetation. As I said, I am excited to be working on this community and as a Durham resident, I hope to see it succeed. This development has been well thought out at the planning stage and will put new home ownership opportunities on an infill basis in an area where bus transit already exists. The developer has made some strong commitments related to design and housing mix, which speak to the needs of the Durham community as a whole. Additionally, the D plan commits to a significant amount of public infrastructure, which will be funded through private means. The project is consistent with the city's long range plans, but more importantly, it makes sense in the context of the area. So we hope to have your support for this development. We have our team available to answer any questions that you have, and I'd like to reserve the remainder of our time for any rebuttal. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Uh, we do have one other individual who signed up as a proponent, and that is Tammy Hayes. Uh, Tammy, are you with us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you're welcome to share your thoughts for a few minutes. If you can give us your name, your address, and uh, you're listed as a proponent for this proposal. Tammy, are you with us? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, please, please okay. share your thoughts. I'm sorry, it kept muting me. Um, my name is Tammy Hayes. I'm with my husband, Thomas Hayes, and we're at 3601 Anger Avenue. Um, if you notice on the map, we're actually at the corner of Cortez and Anger, and everything goes around us, in a sense. Um, we're actually pretty excited about seeing this area developed. It's been a long time. We have lived at this home for about 24 years, and it pretty much has looked the same. Um, except for maybe them paving Cortez. Um, other than that, there really hasn't been a lot done. Um, I guess one of the, we have a few questions because when we met with them last year, um, Cortez wasn't, a, they were saying Cortez wasn't a factor. They were creating another entrance off of Angier on the other side of us going into the development. And now we've noticed that Cortez is now a factor. Um, I, I like the idea of the, turning lanes and the traffic lights, and especially the sidewalks. There have been people that have been hit um, along Angier. There's no space for people to walk or either ride bikes on Angier. It's just road and grass, a ditch. Um, so we're kind of concerned about how this will impact our property. Now with it being Cortez having, I'm assuming it's gonna have to widen the road because if they're gonna create a turning lane and sidewalk and all this stuff, how does that impact us, our property? And then um, will this also mean that this area will then become city limits? Because as of now, we're a county. So will that also mean that we will then become city limits based on all these things? And if this goes through, you know, what kind of estimation data are we looking at as far as um, construction and how long would it last? Those are just a few, you know, questions or concerns that we have right off the top of our head. Great, thank you very much. Yes, uh, sir. During the public comment period, it's a great opportunity to ask those questions. We can see Mr. Ghosh reserve some time as part of their 10 minutes. So he might answer those exactly. in the public comment period or we as commissioners may ask some of those questions as well. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We had uh, one other individual signed up to speak as an opponent, and it's Aaron Hamicky. And Aaron, you may make your remarks if you're able to, to join us. Aaron.
Aaron, I see you are, are on, you're still attending the meeting, so we'd love to hear your thoughts if you're able to um, speak. Mr. Chair, if you can remind her uh, once again, and I think we're going to have to just get used to this, about how the, the, the way she might connect with us and speak to us. Yeah, if, if, Aaron, if you're on by phone, you can hit star nine and that should allow you to speak. It, it looks like you should be able to speak. Hello? Yes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so my name is Erin Hamakey, and I've lived at uh, 16, 613 Pleasant Drive for 12 years now on a property adjacent to the Cortez property. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the neighborhood, we are a semi-rural community with a mix of residents from various backgrounds and income levels. Many of the residents value the privacy, green space, and wildlife habitat that is afforded by this area and the streams that run through it. Several residents have lived in the area for 20 years or more. I have concerns about the proposed rezoning of the property for several reasons. Um, density doesn't seem or seems incompatible with the surrounding area, in my view. It also doesn't seem like a forward thinking development that considers a balance of housing needs with preservation of green space and pervious surfaces. And finally, I think Andrew Avenue simply can't handle the traffic that will be generated by the development and the current F rating for traffic in the neighborhood will go from very bad to even worse. Um, I visited all of the, the households adjacent to the property on Shiloh, Pleasant, Andrew, and Cortez. And out of 26 homes, I was able to access 16 or two thirds of them were opposed to the rezoning request and three households were undecided. 22 residents signed a non-binding petition to protest the rezoning. Two households were in favor of the development, mostly citing hopes for an increase in property values. And I appreciated hearing um, my neighbor, the Hayes' comments um, this evening as well. Um, just speaking for my household, we definitely understand that Durham is a rapidly growing city with a housing shortage and that unbuilt land like this will rise to the surface for a proposed development. We aren't opposed to development of any kind. In fact, my partner is a builder, but we'd like to think that we can plan these new developments with a broader vision of what kind of city we want Durham to become. And we'd like to think that it's possible to achieve without compromising the character of a community that's been here for 100 years. We'd welcome developments at the current zoning or at a revised zoning that balances housing needs with open space that would truly add lasting value to the city and neighborhood. It's difficult to imagine traffic getting any worse than it is now, but that's what would happen um, with this added development. Um, it was truly shocking to see and imagine the 18 minute wait time at the intersection of Pleasant and Anger and 24 minutes at Anger and Glover that is projected if the development plan is enacted and none of the DOT recommendations are implemented. It's also difficult to see how traffic flow on Anger will be appreciably improved with any measure as the railroad tracks limit road widening and the neighboring train yard will continue to present an issue as trains frequently block traffic access at Ellis Road and cause backups onto Andrew Avenue. Finally, I don't feel that the six days that we had to review the development plan and text amendments prior to the meeting is an adequate amount of time. I know that several of my neighbors expressed confusion about what the plans were. Many of the residents in the area are older do not have access to necessary technology, or they speak English as their second language and face significant barriers to actively participating in this process and tonight's meeting, which may explain why there aren't other opponents speaking tonight. Um, unless y'all are willing to vote against the request tonight on the basis of traffic information alone, I hope you'll consider postponing making a decision so that residents can have more time with the development plan or just speak with the developers. If the commission intends to move forward with it, with recommendations, I hope you'll consider recommending development at a density less than proposed or with limited higher density housing balance with substantial protection of trees and wildlife habitat. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I see two other attendees have raised their hands. I assume that means they may also be interested in speaking. Uh, I'll call on you one at a time and you can unmute yourself if you would like to speak. Paul Joffrian, 
and then then we'll get to Mark Welker. Yes, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, the hours are growing late. Um, want to thank my neighbor, uh, Ms. Hamakey, uh, neighbor Hayes for their comments. Um, my name is Paul Joshrian. My wife, Patricia Sykes, and I have lived at 705 Pleasant Drive for 19 years in a home that borders the Cortez Project area. Uh, this neighborhood is a richly diverse, um, economically, culturally, racially neighborhood of approximately three quarters square miles north of the proposed project area. Uh, with some businesses, 200 or more homes, many if not most of which constitute naturally occurring affordable housing. The development pressures on this naturally occurring affordable housing neighborhood are substantial. Once a week or more, we receive unsolicited offers to buy our home or part of our lot toward the southern end that abuts the Cortez project. In no way am I suggesting that the Cortez project is connected with that. I'm just identifying development pressures to sell upon neighborhood residents. With regard to traffic impact, the only way to get out of this neighborhood is by way of Andrew Avenue or Highway 70. Bottlenecks day and night during commuting hours at intersections named by Ms. Hamakey. Pleasant Drive at Anger, Glover Road at Anger, Lynn Road at 70, Pleasant Drive at 70 are formidable. Uh, Anger Avenue between Pleasant Drive and Cortez Drive is narrow, it's two lanes, 12 inch concrete border that empties onto sloping rutted shoulders in both directions. Speed limit is 35, but rarely observed. Pedestrians, neighbors walking their dogs or bicyclists heading up to the Gilboa quick stop at Anger and Glover must choose between risk of a twisted ankle on the rutted shoulder or facing oncoming traffic. There are no sidewalks, there are no curbs. Anger Avenue cannot be widened without abutting the railway right of way or infringing upon the uh, right of way and front yards of residents on the east side. Uh, Adding 200 to 400 additional vehicles to this scene, on top of the 200 to 300 vehicles that will be added because of the approval June 10th of the Pleasant Drive rezoning request, and the additional vehicles that will be added by the Brighton, I don't know the full name, the Brighton Manor, approximately three quarters of a mile south of Glover and Andrew, off of Andrew, is, forgive me for using, <laughs> A strong term, it is an assault on the traffic management capability of this corridor. Um, the quality of life in this residence of this neighborhood, I think deserves consideration. I appreciate fully the developer's comments. It sounds like a wonderful construction. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, and when Ms. Smith comes on and gives a two minute warning, we ask that everyone can finish their thoughts as appropriate. Uh, we have Mark Welker as well. Hi, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, my name is Heather Cross. My husband, Mark Welker, is here with me. We're at 713 Pleasant Drive. Um, our property is just down from uh, the lady earlier. Sorry, I forgot her name already. Um, we came on tonight undecided. We were one of the ones that she had spoken to. And we currently are not really against the development. Um, Traffic is, has gotten worse in the past couple of years with the construction on 70. When they shut down the access of East End Drive, all the traffic that used to take East End, we saw move over here onto Pleasant. And um, back when we first bought, it was right around the time we first bought this house, we were told, you know, a lot of people might rechange their routes when the bypass back to 147 opens back up which is still in the process of being construction and the construction on 70 finishes up. So some of that traffic, you know, we're wondering what's going to happen, what's going to change as the big construction projects end. The mentioning of the possibility of with this project going through that there would be the potential for lights at Pleasant and lights at Glover are a huge bonus to me. Like if that's something that really would go through, that would be huge because those are places that cause really bad bottlenecks, particularly when trains come through, there's no light at Glover. Having that feature would be great. 
Um, so to, to us, you know, we see the need for housing in this area. It's huge, especially something like this that's mixed. It's, it looks like it's going to be more affordable housing than a lot of the other things being built in this area. Um, I'm, I, I have to stand pretty much for it. Um, particularly with some of the things they're doing, it looks really great. And I came on tonight really not sure of where I'd stand. So. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, any additional comments from any members and any, anyone who has not spoken yet this evening? I don't see any other hands up. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, I believe you and your team had a few additional minutes reserved if you would like to make any additional comments or answer any questions. Five yeah, minutes. sure. That would be great. And thank you again. This is Neil Ghosh at the Morning Star Law Group uh, speaking on behalf of the applicant, just for the record. Um, I did want to touch on a couple things. So one, you know, as I mentioned, a traffic study was required for this development. And the developer here is taking the, the traffic, I mean, there are traffic commitments on the D plan and the developer does not, you know, dispute that there are traffic concerns in this area. Um, just to give you an idea, and I'm not suggesting that the, the price of any of these improvements should necessarily play into your decision, but each one of those traffic signals, two of which are committed, um, generally are going to, on the low end, cost about a quarter of a million dollars to install. I have no idea why that is, but that's what it is. And there are two that are that are being considered uh, or being committed uh, as part of this development plan. Uh, whether they will be installed ultimately, as with any traffic light, is going to depend on whether it's warranted per NCDOT. Uh, but given the the uh, level of traffic in this area already, um, you know, you might expect that it would be in, in uh, other developments going on, you might expect that they will be, um, they will be warranted when the time comes to evaluate them. The other thing to be aware of is that one of the main uh, pressures on traffic here is the existence of that rail corridor there and, and the rail yard. Uh, so the, the trains that come in in this area often will come in at a very slow rate uh, because they, they essentially they park there. And sometimes they park in the wrong place and block traffic. And there's no doubt about it. Um, but there is a funded NCDOT project to grade separate, so to bring the track above the road um, at, the, at the intersection of uh, Andrew and Glover. No, I'm sorry, Glo uh, Ellis and Glover. Um, and uh, and that is calculated not by us, by NCDOT on already funded project. Uh, it's, it's project P5706. Uh, that is calculated to alleviate a lot of the traffic concerns that this area experiences already, uh, essentially because it is getting that those trains out of the flow of traffic of, of regular vehicle, vehicular traffic. Um, so in addition to that improvement, this project is committing to additional road improvement. Um, as far as the points of access, because of the number of units that are that are being proposed uh, with this development, the UDO requires at least two points of access. So on the development plan, you can see that there is a point of access proposed along Andrew Avenue, and there also is a point of access on Cortez. Those are the two points of access that are being considered. Um, for this for this development to make it UDO compliant based on the number of units. Uh, Cortez right now is not at a city standard. And I, I think I mentioned before, the developer here is going to be improving Cortez to a city standard for its entire length. Uh, that, that right of way is already dedicated, but if you've been down to the site, then you know you can turn from Andrew onto Cortez uh, and then you can turn left onto the rest of Cortez as it is today. That right of way actually continues all the way down as a paper right of way. It's not been improved, and that's the portion that the developer will be improving across its frontage. Um, the, uh, you know what? It is getting late, and I think I have addressed a lot of the things that that we have heard from the neighbors today. I'd be interested to hear any questions and comments from the planning commissioner. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands from the general public raised to speak. I'll give it one more moment. Uh, seeing none, we will close the public hearing.
and commissioners. Uh, I see a few hands up. I'll start with Commissioner Durkin. Sure. So I have a question for the applicant on price points. Can you, for the record, state what you're expecting the single family homes and the townhomes to go for? Sure, and we've thought a lot about this, and if you'll give me a little latitude, I'd like to speak to it in, in depth if I can. Uh, so I want to make clear that we're not that be, given the late hour. If you could be late, late in the evening, if we can um, make it brief, that would be appreciated. Well, sure. Uh, so I just want to make clear that we're not committing to any particular price point. No, uh, no, no. Just expect it. Sure. Yeah. The builder believes that the townhomes will start at around the 204,000 mark and will sell at a top range near 229,000. And for the single family detached homes, the builder intends to start selling those at a price near 250,000 with the top end around 290,000. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I, that seems high to me for this area. I don't think that would qualify as additional naturally occurring affordable housing as was mentioned by one of the participants um, that spoke. I agree that there is, is a naturally occurring affordable housing in that area. I don't think it's new construction for sale um, at those price points. One other thing related to affordability that I wanted to raise was the additional design commitment. The first one that says the development shall include a variety of town, home, unit, and single family dwelling sizes to reach a broader market of family size, home transition, and housing affordability. I have no idea what that means and I have no idea how it will be implemented and how it, someone will confirm that it's the development has is in compliance with that commitment. So my question is really more to staff. Does, was this vetted? Like how, how, how do you prove that this was in compliance? How would you monitor this at all? Amy Sarnak with the planning department. Good evening, everybody. Um, so yes, the the design commitments have been uh, vetted um, and we just received them uh, recently. The, the intent as, as I understand it in terms of this particular proffer um, is to address some of the concerns that the Planning Commission have raised on other applications to provide a variety of different sizes, um, and it's um, and obviously they we we don't have proffers or specifics in terms of the um, the price points, but we have heard concerns regarding um, providing a variety of of housing sizes. So I I believe that that's the intent. That the applicant is trying to um, to achieve, the design commitments are are our commitments, um, and so um, we so feel it's really meant to be a lead in to the remaining four bullet points in the additional design commitments. Because if that's the case, it should be deleted. It's I think it's very confusing and just provides lip service to the planning commission to as if they're giving us what we've been asking for. I don't think it gives us anything except for vague language that I'm not sure how you would enforce that. Okay, understood. And I, and I, can, see, um, I can see how that might be in, inferred. So. Jamie, mm -hmm. if it's appropriate, I mean, we, we can strike that one. I don't think that would cause any kind of delay. Uh, it's, the, it's the first one, if I understand mm -hmm. you, Aaron. The first yeah. one, yeah. listen. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> every almost every development I ask you, have you used the affordable housing density bonus? Have you considered it? And everybody says no. And everybody knows that I would love to have enforceable affordable housing in Durham. However, I don't think this language gets us there, and I think it's a very dangerous path to go down of pretending you're providing something that you're not, and and making the public and our elected officials pretend that they're providing something that's being requested and it's not getting anywhere near it. So as I mentioned, we we can strike that. And staff has no problem if that is removed. I mean, Consider I'm, it stricken. For my other my fellow commissioners, I'm I'm not going to be voting for this one, based on the concerns I raised. Thank you, Commissioner Durkin. Uh, Commissioner Miller. 
So there's a lot in this um, that I like and look for. Uh, mix of unit types in a large pro project, uh, density level that is uh, not high by Durham standards, but might be a little high for the area, but the area is been developed in a pattern that has some natural separations in it. Um, uh, a mix of unit sizes. Uh, the law doesn't let us commit to, to actual price points, but it does allow us to commit to unit sizes. And based upon the idea that smaller units are generally cheaper, they don't have to be, but they generally are. That's one way to get at the at the affordability, relative affordability uh, problem, and I appreciate that. Uh, uh, more thoughtful commitments on uh, design elements. Um, lots of open space reserved. Of course, much of it had to be reserved because of stream uh, buffers, uh, but. Um, so a lot of good things here. But the reason why I wanted to speak early on is um, Erin Hamicky, uh, I think I, I'm not sure I pronounced her name correctly. If I have not, I apologize, uh, has pointed out that uh, the ability of the neighbors to actually see the development plan uh, is less than a week. Uh, this worries me. Uh, if we're serious about really engaging with the public with a development plan rezoning of this magnitude, with so many issues, especially relating to traffic and what have you, um, I think we need to be better about getting that out there so that people can make thoughtful comments. Uh, I am concerned, as she was this evening, that more people in this area might have spoken had they had a chance to a better chance to see, absorb, and understand uh, the development plan. The developer today um, uh, has made a whole lot of proffers that changed the development plan considerably. Um, there was no way for these neighbors to see this. I actually shared uh, the list just today with. Um, Ms. Hamicky, um, to see if it changes her view of the of the project. Um, I'm just uncomfortable proceeding with a 50 acre project with lots of potential impacts affecting these neighbors uh, on the basis that they've had six days to figure it out. It's complicated enough. Uh, with any amount of time, but six days seems just doesn't seem to be fair. And I'm not blaming anybody. The developer certainly is not responsible for the shortness of notice. Um, we're operating under some very strange rules. And uh, it's just hard. And we have lots of meetings scheduled. Uh, and I even I, I have to admit, I constantly lose track of where we are. Um, so I get it. But ultimately, these neighbors have one shot to understand what's going to go on around them. Uh, I went out to Pleasant Drive. It is one of the few streets in Durham that is actually aptly named. Uh, it is a beautiful place. Uh, accidentally, one of the loveliest neighborhoods in town. And it reminded me that in our frenzy about density and affordability and all these other things, we have to reserve places in Durham County that are like Pleasant Drive. Um, and I believe this property can be developed in a way that doesn't necessarily threaten Pleasant Drive, but it's just another issue. And I believe the people who live on in the Pleasant Drive neighborhood um, have a right to understand and absorb and make thoughtful comments on a project like this so that we can be guided um, by what they say. We, as I said, in connection with the last case, I'll say it with this case, the people who live there know it best, understand it best. Um, and the information they give us about uh, their area and what they want for it uh, are extremely important. 
so, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move that we continue this for 30 days, not so the developer and the neighbors can work something out or anything like that, just so that the neighbors can understand this project and come back to a continued public hearing and uh, make sure that everybody who might care about this has had a chance to speak to us. Uh, Commissioner Miller, at the moment, uh, I, I didn't hear you make the motion. I believe you were saying you would like to make the motion. No, no, I am making the motion. Okay. Uh, I know Commissioner Baker would like to speak as well, but it is a, it is a motion. And if there is a second, then I'll, we... I'll hold off my comments and I'll second Commissioner Miller. Thank you. So uh, we have a, a motion for a, a one cycle continuance with the second. Uh, we, we, we can, uh, if someone would, wants to speak, uh, on the commission to the vote to the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Alturk, I see your hand up. I don't know if that was from before. No, that's on the motion, if you don't mind, Chair. Nope. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you know, it, just like the last case, you know, it is our, uh, we can call for continuance or vote for continuance without the applicant's permission, but I do often like to ask the applicant what they will do and what you know what they are thinking in terms of a two two cycle continuance not not because we need their permission but i, I would like to hear from them um if, if they would like this and what they would try to do in the next two months to to to, to bring along the neighbors in, in this case so i'd like to ask that to mr ghosh if that's okay thank you commissioner and for the record i believe it was a one cycle continuance that is the okay. is the motion okay Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that. And so thank you for bringing that up, uh, Chair Busby. And thank you for the question, Commissioner Al Turk. Um, so look, uh, we know we added proffers at the last minute. Jamie worked diligently to get those on the PowerPoint and to vet them. Uh, we're really proud of them. But we also know the neighbors have not had an opportunity to look at them. Uh, we welcome a one month delay and uh, and and we'll, we'll be happy to come back. Uh, in a month after we after the neighbors have had more of an opportunity to, to digest these uh, these new commitments in particular, and frankly, uh, after the planning commissioners have had an opportunity to, to digest them, I know you got your packets kind of late to begin with, and then you probably never even got the new conditions uh, until tonight. So um, I think it's I I think it's warranted, and and we welcome it. Mr. Alter. Thank you. I just, I think, I think Miss uh, Hammocky mentioned this in her comments, and I, I may be mis misremembering, but I think she mentioned that you know there, there are likely a lot of people who want to speak on this case. That even in a month, or even in you know, if if it is a one cycle continuance, then that really means only a week or two of of trying to reach out to those to those folks that live around this this neighborhood. So I just. Um, I guess I would caution against a one cycle, only a one cycle continuance, or I would also, or, and I would also urge the developer and the applicant to, uh, to really try to reach out to, to folks that, uh, to the neighborhood in a way that's, you know, relatively, in a way that's inclusive and that's, um, and so, and I'm happy to, to work with Ms. Hammock here. I think a number of us are happy to to facilitate those meetings, but um, it's just, it, it's difficult for, it's hard for me to see how that can be, be done in a way that I think is what we are hoping to do in the long run here in Durham, which is to involve neighbors early on, to, to make the process more transparent. Um, ju that's just a word of caution. I will vote for the continuance, but uh, it's, just, it's just a word of caution for the applicant and for the neighbors. Thank you, Commissioner Alturk. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised with the commissioners. And so we do have a, a motion on the floor for a, a 30 day, one cycle continuance. And we'll have a roll call vote, please. Um, yes, I wanted to point out that that would be, um, I wanted to make sure that we got the date of the meeting on the record, please, if that's okay. Yeah. That yeah. Would be August 11th. That's my motion. Okay, um, Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? 
Yes. Commissioner Amendolia? Yes. Commissioner Darkin? Yes. Commissioner Altark? Uh, yes. Commissioner Buzz, um, Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Landfried? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kington? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Uh, excused absence. Oh, sorry, he's absent. I'm late and I forgot. <laughs> Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Okay. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Okay. It's unanimous 13 to 0 to continue to August 11th. Thank you. See you next month. Thank you very much. So we have two items under new business as we head into the home stretch. And the first is the FY21 planning department work plan. And so we'll start with the staff report. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Young with the planning department. And I'm coming to you tonight to hopefully talk quickly about the department's work program. As you know, we are required by the interlocal agreement that creates the city county planning department to submit to the governing bodies every year a proposal for the work that the department will do. As you also know, uh, the vast majority of what's on the work program are things that are mandated by law or by city policy program or practice. And there is very little room for discretionary projects. Right now, we're in the middle of a very large discretionary project, which is the new comprehensive plan that of course um, remains uh, on the work program. There's still much work to do and we are kind of regrouping those efforts and hopefully you'll be getting an update soon on that project. Um, but we are adding uh, two other discretionary projects to the work program for next year um, in response to growing concerns about our um, environmentally related regulations and open space planning. So um, one of the projects is to strengthen the regulations in the Unified Development Ordinance regarding natural heritage sites, um, Durham inventory sites, and historic uh, properties. There are several instances in the ordinance that just say um, very uh, lightly to protect or preserve these types of assets, but they give no regulations as to what that might look like, what the expectation is. And so often at the administrative site plan stage, it is very difficult to enforce um, for a developer to do anything to protect these resources. So one project will be to work on actually strengthening and putting teeth to those regulations. The other project is going to be an analysis of all of our adopted open space plans. There are many, many items from those plans that have not been implemented. And uh, we are gonna be looking at those, trying to work with our partner departments in the Durham Parks and Rec Department, Durham General Services, and Durham County um, uh, Real Estate, their open space um, acquisition program to see what items from those plans still need to be done and try and work within CIP and other mechanisms to get them um, funded and implemented. So. Although I like to joke and say that we're the planning department, we're not the implementing department. Um, I definitely think that we have a role to help um, make those plans a reality um, and deliver on the promises that were um, shared with the community in the development of those plans. So those are two projects that we will be um, adding to the work program um, for next year. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you all may have. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations on your your uh, your role as the acting planning director. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any comments or questions for uh, for staff or just comments in general? And this is an item that, that we vote on, correct, this evening? Correct, we would need a recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm really glad to see these uh, additional projects. And I'm going to throw out just one thing, and it's consonant with what I've always said when we get to this stage in the year. I think that we need to be intentional um, and create better programs 
for public engagement, lowering, lowering the barriers that the complexity of this process naturally create for uh, people to become involved. And when I say people, I mean people who are not engineers or land planners or attorneys or people who stand to make a lot of money uh, from planning decisions. Uh, the folks whose interest in our planning and zoning rules are the places where they live. Uh, and I would love to see us create uh, more and better uh, ways for them to, to get involved with adequate time and without fear. Um, I know we have some programs that are on hold we were beginning the business of having planners available so that people could ask questions in front of planning commission mem meetings. I'm not sure how that was going, but I applauded the effort. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things from the planning academies that were being being done. But th they're very small starts in what I think we ought to do. I would love to see the planning department have uh, some ombudsman positions uh, that where planners dedicated to uh, the business of advising, uh, not just answering questions, but actually advising um, uh, what I will call ordinary people about how to protect their interests from their point of view. And I know that could be controversial, but at some point I think we've got to do that or we're never going to get better. Uh, my time on this commission is short. The chance uh, to talk about, as a commission member, to talk about uh, the work plan again may never come up. So I'm going to throw it out there. I intend to vote in favor of this work plan. I will make the motion if it, if so, if that's required. But I do want to say it out loud uh, uh, so that all my fellow commission members uh, can hear it. Uh, this was my concern when I first came on Planning Commission many years ago, and it will be my concern when I leave it uh, uh, a few months from now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Other questions or comments? Uh, I would just echo Commissioner Miller in, in, in the big picture, and I'm, I'm pleased to see what's in the work plan. I wish the Planning Department had more resources to tackle more items, um, and that's been a continued theme as well, but I'll plan to vote for this and I'm happy to entertain a motion for approval. Well, I promised so. Mr. Chair, I move that we send fiscal year uh, 2021 planning department work program forward to the elected bodies, that would be the city council and the board of county commissioners uh, with a favorable recommendation. Uh, I will, uh, in our opportunity to comment it, uh, in writing, uh, echo some of the things that I said to you folks. Do we have a second? Second. second. Uh, we'll give it to Commissioner Morgan on the second. That was moved by Commissioner Miller and we'll have the roll call vote, please. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yeah. Commissioner M. Amandalia? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Lanefried? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. I think you again, skipped I'm over sorry. me again. What's that? I'm a yes. Oh, I skipped you again. Oh, you know why I marked you out earlier. I'm so sorry, Commissioner Miller. Yes. It's late again. Woo. Thank you. It passed us 13 0. Thank you. Uh, Thank Commissioner you. Miller, I believe she marked you out years ago, but. Yeah. <laughs> don't think I don't know it. And she isn't the first. Well, I tried <laughs> not to mark you absent earlier, but they, they were intent on voting to excuse you. And I was going to wait to see if you showed up because I had this feeling you would, and you did. Yeah. Well, like a bad penny. <laughs> That's right. We have one final item, the item we added to the agenda, the vice chair election, and I will hand that over to the staff. 
So um, per the rules of procedure, um, Chair Busby moved up to replace Chair Hyman uh, because uh, the election is, we don't have an election until later in the year. And so because her, because she was term limited, he just would move up and replace her. So what we would need to have an election for tonight is just a vice chair to serve until our next regular election. So um, the floor is open and staff can take a nomination at this time. Uh, Ms. Smith, I'd like to nominate Commissioner Kenshin. And, and I would note that uh, I'm a city appointee, so we, we do need to make sure that the vice chair is a county appointee. Yes, we, we typically try to have uh, one of each from each jurisdiction as chair or vice chair. Do nominations need a second? Uh, yes, please. Uh, can I second that, please? Sure. Are there any other nominations from the floor at this time? I think Mr. Baker has his hand up. Well, I was just going to say that I was also planning to nominate uh, Commissioner Kenshin. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so if there's no other nominations from the floor and no other discussion, um, I'm ready to take a, um, a vote if the commission is ready. Does Commissioner Kitchen have to accept that nomination? Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, think, we don't I care what he thinks. Yes, I guess he should. Drafted. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kitchen, do you accept the nomination? I do. I do. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to go down the roll call one more time, and I'm not going to forget Mr. Miller. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Amendola? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? Oh, excuse me, Chair Busby? Yes. Old habits die hard. Commissioner Lanfrey. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Kenton. Um, yes. You don't have to vote for yourself, but it's That's fine. Commissioner, sure. Baker. <laughs> Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Lowe. Commissioner well, Lowe. Let me think. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Commissioner McIver. Yes. Okay. Um, the election to um, to elect vice, uh, Mr. Kenshin vice chair is 13-0. Um, I have one last really quick announcement if you all will humor me, um, if, if that's okay. Um, I sent out an email last week to our, uh, I call them our frequent flyer applicants. It's our group of applicants that you see most, most of the time. We have a group uh, of of applicants that are our typical ones that we see and, and deal with. And I sent an email out explaining to them that based on recent comments and concerns that were expressed at city council meetings, um, and we haven't had the same concerns expressed at Board of County Commissioners, but we have not had the same set of circumstances either. So they may would feel the same, but definitely city council has expressed this concern a lot lately about development plans, zonings that have left the planning commission and between the time they leave planning commission and they are presented to city council, they have changed dramatically. Um, and sometimes they change and, and, and it's not sometimes all the time they change dramatically to be more stringent because on a development plan, you have to exceed the ordinance minimum requirements. You can't go backwards and do less. If you go backwards and do less, you automatically go back to the planning commission. But there's a sec section in the ordinance that allows the director to have some um, some purview and some review of what is considered significant enough to send it back to the planning commission once it's already been to planning commission, but before it gets to council, if they change the, the commitments on the plan. And so we, um, we've taken a, a, a fairly conservative, aggressive approach, in my opinion, and, and we reserve the right to make adjustments as we go along, but we have informed our, the applicants that going forward effective yesterday, any commitments that are made after planning commission with the exception of monetary text commitments, like if they want to make a monetary text commitment to the Durham public schools or the dedicated housing fund or something very, very simple, which would that pond earlier may have been an easy one because to retain a pond on the development plan is a fairly simple note that can be put on the development plan. Um, but we do reserve the right to re review those at planning commission. But if they make those changes after planning commission, we are going to send them back. 
they are not going to be taken to the governing body with significant changes anymore going forward. Um, there's a couple of cases that missed the that missed our effective date of yesterday. So there might be a couple of cases that move forward with at their own risk where they they're changing the plans after planning commission to make them more restrictive or adding more text commitments and design commitments. Um, we've cautioned them about that, but there was a recent case uh, at city council that was, has been referred back to you. You will see it in a, on a future agenda. It was for 1432 Ellis Road, uh, and it was referred back because of the number of text commitments that were added after planning commission and before it got to city council. And the city council felt very strongly that the planning commission should see those commitments and have the um, ability to review those. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Again, um, we reserve the right to modify as we go if we see necessary. We are more than happy to work with you on the spot and with applicants on the spot when it's reasonable and when we can vet the commitments and we are comfortable with doing that the night of the Planning Commission meeting. Otherwise, we will ask for an automatic continuance to work those things out at the Planning Commission level before they get to the elected officials. So I hope that that makes sense and we'll move forward in that direction and see how it works and certainly take your comments or concerns as we go. Madam Chair, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I have a question about how this will work. Yeah, go ahead. So in Article 3 of the UDO, we've got a 90-day clock on the business of the Planning Commission. Uh, and so if we have a situation where it comes to us, we don't like it, we make a lot of comments, the developer listens to our comments and becomes concerned because they got a, they did not get an enthusiastic uh, vote from the Planning Commission, so they want to amend their uh, proposal going forward to City Council. My first concern is, is if we take a really, really strict view on changes and send everything back to the Planning Commission, we may have some developers dig in and just simply refuse to make changes. Um, I don't know whether that will happen or not, because if they did, we would probably just vote again. Uh, if it came back to us, it might be unenthusiastic or they'll just push ahead to the council without making changes. I mean, I like the fact that our influence causes developers to make changes, especially if it is in favor of or bends towards what we have said. The second concern, though, is the 90-day rule. If it gets to, if it is, what happens to a a project that where we've said no, they want to make changes before they go ahead to council. That means it's got to come back to us. Uh, the the 90-day clock ticks all through that. Um, is it time then to go make a special um, change to the UDO that says that? when something has to be re-referred to the planning commission that the 90 days is told uh, or is that a statutory provision that we can't alter so the first the first statement um my comment on that would be that that's why we're gonna we're going to commit to be flexible and we may um make some adjustments as we go in this process good good, good. Because we we started off uh, more conservative and more aggressive because we really want these things worked out when they come to you. We want these things worked out during the review. We want the legwork done ahead of time. And we want the things worked out with you, uh, the planning commissioners. And that's why staff is willing to, if we have to ask for continuance while it's still in your 90-day period, to work those things out before it ever gets to council, that's what we will do. We're going to be be probably become a little more um, or diligent about that rather than and it actually has not been an issue we've just of late we've had some plans that have added a lot of text commitments after the fact and uh, you know adding one or two is one thing but when you've got a you know a, a list of 15 or 16 things that are added and the plan changes quite significantly after the planning commission sees it that's what was the um impetus to this I see that the acting director has come on the screen, so I'm not sure if she wants to say something. So I'm I don't think we have to say acting. She's yeah. the director in my book. Yeah, exactly. I agree. <laughs> I'm trying to be appropriate, so I'm going to let her speak. Um, yeah. It's all just an act. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the ordinance, um, Commissioner Miller, that is a great question. What the ordinance says is that um, we can refer something back due to significant changes for an additional hearing. So that additional hearing would start another 90-day cycle with the plan. Oh, excellent. Answers my question. Thank yep. you. 
uh, if it's an act, it's a convincing performance. Thank you very much. I do my best work. <laughs> I was actually pulling that section up to uh, to read that. Yeah, and you're so back every two weeks. Question. There you go. But I, I hope that made sense. What I the first part. It did. It did, and I'm very grateful. Great. Thank you. And and I'll just add from my perspective. I mean, Commissioner Miller, I appreciate your your question about the the timing issue because I hadn't thought about that. I think this is going to be very encouraging and a positive, especially because we often have votes where we all vote no and we write our comments and then a whole bunch of new things are added. And it, it's probably challenging for the governing body to know, did we vote no because of what we had in front of us at the time? Or would we vote yes with all the new additions? It, it really does, I think, allow us to be playing the role we're supposed to play as an advisory board. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out, but, but I appreciate the staff taking this step and I look forward to seeing how that plays out for us as a commission. And Mr. Chair, if I may, I have a, 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 another little bit of business. Um, I wasn't here uh, at the beginning of the meeting when we welcomed Ms. Landfried and Mr. Amendolia. And so one, uh, I want to add my welcome to the welcome I'm sure you gave them. Uh, I also want to make sure that I am pronouncing uh, Austin's last name correctly. So I'm going to ask him to say it out loud for me to hear. Uh, well, it's actually kind of contested in my family, but I pronounce it Amendolia. Well, very good. I'm going with, in, until your mother calls me, I'm going with you. Uh, <laughs> If she agrees with me, so that's all good. All right, so it's all good. The uh, other thing I'd like to suggest, Mr. Busby, is we have two committees that are serving. One of those committees, because uh, 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 Ms. Hyman has left us, is a man down, um, uh, to use a lacrosse term. And uh, I thought, uh, since it is up to you to uh, appoint people to committees um, and and it might be of interest to our two new members to join uh, one, the other, or both of the committees if they want to, and that's consonant with your view of the committee's uh, business. Um, we have a uh, the last of three scheduled meetings with regard to the affordable housing slash trees committees this week, uh, and then uh, Mr. Baker's committee on the UDO. Uh, is going to be scheduling meetings, but I wanted to make sure our two new members had an opportunity to join us in that work if that was their interest. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing it up. I, I will say I, the, the affordable housing group is finishing up its work this week and that will be coming back to us. And so uh, you're welcome to get in touch with Commissioner Miller who has been helping shepherd that process. The, the longer term effort is Commissioner Baker's uh, committee that is working on UDO items. I believe it's the, that committee has met once, maybe twice thus far, twice. Uh, but, but that does have a longer uh, shelf life. And you should also feel free to be in touch with either myself or with Commissioner Baker uh, if, if that is of interest to you, if tonight hasn't scared you off already. Uh, we set up committees from time to time as, as issues arise. So there'll be other opportunities as well if you uh, would rather wait for a, a new committee, they, they do rise up periodically. So uh, just to clarify, Mr. Busby, uh, am I to take it from your comments that if either uh, Ms. Landfried or Mr. Amendolia uh, were to join our committee uh, at its meeting on Thursday that I would uh, treat them as voting members of the committee? I. Uh, Feel free to reach out to me. I, I don't think that would be a problem as long as we don't trip having a quorum. No, I, I don't think it's it's not a quorum issue. It's it's an uh, open meetings law issue, but uh, I don't think the addition of even both of them would challenge that. Thank you very much. You bet. Uh, if there aren't any other items recognizing the late hour, we will adjourn and I will see all of you next Tuesday when we meet once again. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Congratulations, Armir. Yes. I hope it's what you wanted. <laughs> you, get, you get it right. Thank you. Right.